Okay, folks, good evening. Uh, we're about to get started, if you'd like to take your seats. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight to uh, discuss the future of Palomar Airport. My name is Jason Haber. I'm with the uh, city manager's office. I'm the assistant to the city manager, and I'll be uh, helping moderate and kind of guiding us through uh, tonight's agenda a bit. Uh, as many of you probably already know, uh, Palomar Airport is located within the city of Carlsbad, but is owned and operated by San Diego County. Um, and uh, through this county's process of reviewing uh, and taking comments on their uh, airport master plan and draft EIR, the city council received uh, numerous public comments uh, related to that document and, and quite a bit of community feedback on that. And at a meeting in early April, they directed staff to pursue three uh, actions related to the airport. Uh, one was to enter into discussions with county staff about how we can work collaboratively with the county uh, related to the future of the airport. The second is to initiate a stakeholder dialogue, which is uh, what we're doing here tonight. Engage the community, hear from you about your concerns and questions related to the airport um, and the operations and facilities there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And third, to develop and implement a strategy uh, for the city related to our future relationship with the airport. So the county uh, released their draft master plan and EIR, which is a 20-year blueprint for uh, how they'll be developing facilities and operations at the airport. And it includes things like um, safety features at either end of the runway, an extension of the runway to the east, um, and various realignments of the runways and taxiways there, among other things. Um, in preparing formal comments on behalf of the city, uh, in response to the master plan and the EIR, the city engaged uh, legal advisors that specialize in airport issues and land use uh, related to the airport. And those folks, I'm happy to say, are with us tonight. Uh, and they'll be available to provide uh, background and uh, information related to the regulatory landscape that applies to airports, and specifically Palomar, and also to discuss uh, some strategies that the city may want to consider going forward um, related to the airport. And certainly, as well, to answer any questions and provide inf any information uh, that you may be interested in. Let's see, our goals tonight, you know, we want to make sure that we have a good, clear understanding of the community concerns and interests related to the airport. And so uh, in that regard, you know, we really encourage your participation. We want to make sure we hear from you. We encourage you to ask questions uh, and seek the clarification that you need. To that end, we've provided comment cards, question cards. If you're not comfortable uh, or would rather not come up to the microphone and ask your question, you're welcome to fill out your uh, question on that card and provide that to staff. We will. Uh, moderate those questions on your behalf. Um, we did hear from the county today uh, that they intend to uh, release for recirculation uh, a handful of sections of their EIR for another 45-day review period. Um, and that'll be going out this Thursday, June 21st. Uh, there's also a meeting of the Palomar Airport Advisory Committee that, meet, uh, that night. It'll be out for a 45-day review. Uh, with comments due back to the county by August 6th. The sections that they've indicated that will be re-released uh, relate to biology, um, greenhouse gas emissions, energy consumption, and the runway protection zones. So um, that information will be available on the county website beginning this Thursday. Let's see, this is not a council meeting. Right? You won't see uh, our city council here. It's really an opportunity for us to engage in a dialogue with staff, the community and our consultants. Um, if you have questions, this is not necessarily an opportunity to provide public testimony on this issue. It's really to make sure that we have um, common understanding and get those issues on the table uh, and have that discussion. We have, in addition to um, our legal advisors, several staff members here tonight representing various departments of the city that are uh, involved and have been involved in crafting the city's response to the county's EIR and their master plan. Uh, so they will be available for any technical questions uh, that you might have. Um, and with that, I want to introduce our city attorney, Celia Brewer, uh, who will talk to you a bit and introduce our presenters tonight. So 
Thank you again for coming. Good evening, everybody. How is everybody? I am actually really excited to be here tonight. I think this is going to be a really positive meeting for all of you. Those of you who have been to several airport workshops um, will hear some familiar issues. Those of you who haven't yet been are going to get a good overview of the project. We have tried to listen very hard to you in this meeting planning. We will have several opportunities for you to provide input. We'll try to summarize information to make sure that we get it right. Um, and we are going to incorporate everything that we hear tonight from you into a strategy that we can ultimately take back to the city council in an open session meeting. So um, we're going to break the meeting into two parts. The first part is going to be a refresher course um, or a brief reminder of where we've been, a review of our legal positions, the positions that we took on the draft master plan and EIR. And then we're going to have some time for questions for all of you to ask the questions that you've been <coughs> hanging on to for so long. Um, I know a lot of you have been begging for an interactive environment. This is it. Um, and then we'll take a little break. And then we're going to get to what I consider to be the really exciting part of this meeting. And that is a presentation of um, strategies that we might be able to incorporate in Carlsbad that will take us forward. So looking beyond just the confines of the master plan and the EIR, we really want to look forward and hear from you. What do you think would make for a better relationship? And we want to be pragmatic and honest about what we can and can't accomplish as a city with respect to this type of facility. But I'm also very hopeful um, that if we hear from you that we might be able to make things better for a lot of you. Now, We've had four meetings, or this is our fourth meeting on this airport. The first meeting you heard from our legal counsel on basically a, an overview of where we stood from a regulatory perspective. Um, and we did that in an open session, which is a little bit interesting and a little bit vulnerable for us, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and we also got an overview from the county via video. Our second meeting was taken up primarily with the master plan and EIR review. It was very technical, a lot of technical issues. The third one, we went to the council and we said, now that you've heard all of this council, what do you want to do about the airport? And they said, well, we're going to take your recommendation staff and we're going to have you go out into the community and gather some feedback about what your, your concerns are still after having heard everything, and what the, count, the community wants. And then we're going to roll that all into a ball and hopefully package it up neatly and take it back to the council. Now, my relationship with the city is I'm the city attorney, right? So I give legal advice to the city through the city's council. And that advice is confidential. It's protected by attorney-client privilege my same privileges apply to our attorneys and counsel that we have here tonight. So there are going to be legal questions that we may or may not be able to answer. We'll be very respectful and say, I'm not going to answer that in open session because some of that belongs to the client, the client city. So that might be frustrating for you, but I'm just going to tell you that up front. However, we can talk about the state of the law. We can talk about public facts that are available in other jurisdictions. So there is definitely plenty that we can do. But having said that, there are some things we're not going to do. We're also not going to engage in legal argument. We're not going to play Perry Mason and try to make this into a courtroom. We have an arena for legal arguments, um, and it's a great one. It's called court. <laughs> I end up there a lot. It's not that I want to be there. Um, and that really winnows out passion and argument, leaves you with facts and law. So it's, a, it's actually a good place for resolutions of disputes. But that's not what we're going to do tonight. Tonight, we really want to generate more um, input from all of you, and we want you to get some answers to the questions that you you've had. Okay? So, when this issue started heating up in our community, I realized that one thing that was missing from the input that I was getting from the community and in my own legal office and in our own staff was really a good working knowledge of airports themselves and the federal regulations and laws that are available, um, uh, excuse me, applicable to airports. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized we were really missing that piece. And to me, the real money value tonight is with our guest speakers that we've brought here. And that's um, Sarah Rockwell and Peter Kirsch. They've been working in airports and airport law for years and years. We have one airport. Peter's probably worked on 50 airports, maybe more. Um, <laughs> so I think that, that you're going to really enjoy the presentation. And I brought them here for a purpose, and that's really to educate us and to tell you what might be possible. There are some community members who have had really um, 
grandiose visions of what our powers are as a city. I think some of you might need to scale back those expectations, but we hope that you will at least leave here with realistic expectations of what we think we can and cannot do and what we think we can realistically take to the council. So if there are no more questions before we start, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sarah. Kirsch or Sarah? Sarah. Sarah Rockwell. She's going to be beginning the presentation. I think I'll just start with your microphone. Okay, since I just here you have go. one slide. To go. Oh, okay. Good evening. My name is Sarah Rockwell from the law firm of Kaplan, Kirsch & Rockwell, and I'm here tonight oh, sorry, with my partner, Peter Kirsch. And thank you, Celia and Jason and everybody who has helped organize this event. Um, I think it's really important to have this interaction and dialogue um, back and forth because these are, these are really tough, complicated issues. None of this is easy. When we've analyzed these issues, we've gone back and forth, had lots of discussions with Celia and staff and among ourselves, frankly. So. Um, so, so none of these answers or, or things that we tell you tonight are things that we're just flippantly saying we think this is the answer. We've truly thought a lot about, about these issues. And I was saying earlier tonight that um, this is a great example of a situation that probably involves uh, almost every land use and airport issue that you could imagine in the state of California. Um, so with that, um, Celia sort of gave, gave you an idea of the way that this tonight it will be structured, but let me just go over it. For the next 20 minutes or so, for the first half of this present presentation, Peter and I are going to go over um, in, in a much more abbreviated fashion the presentation that we made at the um, City Council a couple of months ago. And, um, and I apologize in advance if that feels fast and that we're going through it quickly, but there's a lot we'd like to cover tonight. So um, during the Q&A period, you should feel free to ask questions if we, if we went too quickly. Um, so we'll do that for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll stop and have a Q&A discussion for about a half an hour uh, to talk about any questions or, or thoughts that you have about the things that we have um, said in the past and what we have said in our first part. Um, then we will then take a quick break and then we'll come back and have another presentation about various approaches that um, the city might adopt vis-a-vis -vis the airport in a looking forward sort of basis. And we will talk about a whole continuum of possible approaches and the challenges and opportunities associated with any of those approaches. And then again, we'll have another Q&A discussion about those approaches. We'd really like to hear your input on um, the, the whole range of possibilities, whether um, the city should be very aggressive, not aggressive, somewhere in between. And, um, and that will be a really good opportunity, I think, for a lot of back and forth dialogue. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to Peter. Thanks, Sarah. I think this works, doesn't it? You know, Celia, I'm Peter Kirsch. Celia set, set really an unreasonable expectation for Sarah and me this evening because she said you were going to enjoy this. And uh, generally, people don't enjoy hearing lawyers speak. So, um, but the good news is, those of you who haven't yet been to law school, this is sort of like an advanced placement course. So at the end of this, you can go in and say you know everything there is to know about airport law and about everything you need to know about land use law as it applies to airports. And as Sarah said, we're going to run through this really quickly. There'll be plenty of chance for Q&A, but we want to make sure we lay, if you will, the foundation for what the issues are and how then we want to look at, at solving them. So a couple of basic principles. Let's separate San Diego County from the city of, of Carlsbad. A couple of principles that apply to the, city of San, to the county of San Diego. First of all, the county does not have complete control over its airport. You may think it does, but it doesn't. Number two, is that airports are subject to a very complex set of federal regulations governing how they operate, how they build, how they don't build, how they buy property, how they sell property. All of these are really important issues that regulate really A to Z from morning to night everything the airport does. Number three is there's a very complex interplay among the various different levels of law, federal law, state law, local law, county law. And so if you think you know one of the laws, all you know is one of the laws. Because there are lots of other laws that will come into play in terms of what the county can and cannot do. 
And the last point I think is really important to remember, and this is particularly true for those of you who think or have worked in local governments before, and that is the usual rules that apply to how local governments operate facilities don't apply to airports. So if you think you understand how roads are built, if you think you understand how police departments operate, don't assume that it's the same for airports because it's really very, very different. So let's go then to the rules that govern the city of Carlsbad. Carlsbad, of course, doesn't operate the airport. It doesn't own the airport. And as a result, the city has very limited authority inside the aeronautical areas of the airport. Now, the airport has lots of things that aren't aeronautical as well. But if you keep in mind what are the aeronautical functions of the airport, the city has very, very little control. Number two, and this may be obvious, but once you get outside the airport, controlling the land use around the airport is largely within the city's control and not the county's control. So what is built right near the airport? The county has very little control and the city has considerable control. And number three, and this is the one that I think that's most disappointing for most people, is that the city has almost no authority, I'd say 99.9% .9 no authority, to control how aircraft operate into and out of the airport. And we're going to get much more into detail into the issue of aircraft operations because no big surprise, it's the aircraft operations that generate most of the concern and most of the interest in the, in the community. So let's, let's sort of start as one way of looking at the question of noise. And noise is not the only topic we're going to talk about tonight, but I know that for an awful lot of people, noise is, is very high on the list. And although this isn't supposed to be a statistical representation on the slide here, what I want you to come away from is understanding that when it comes to controlling noise around the airport, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, has almost all the power. San Diego County, as the operator and owner of the airport, has a little bit of power, and all the rest of us have so little that you can barely see it on the chart. And again, that's important to keep in mind because when we talk about what we want to do about noise issues, we need to remember who has the authority. So let me walk through a little bit of the Law 101 here to help folks understand the primary sources of the law. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Anybody who wants to spend time on it can go to law school or come see me later um, because it's very interesting to me and very boring to you. Um, number one, the US Constitution says that federal law is supreme over state law, county ordinances, city ordinances. Maybe that's obvious, but when the federal government has a law on the subject, the, the city can't preempt that, can't, can't do it, overdo it itself. Number two is the Commerce Clause, which is part of the Constitution that says that we should have commerce between the states, interstate commerce. And I want to go to the second bullet here because it's really important and it's a cardinal principle in airport law. And that is that if someone wants to restrict the operation of a public airport, if, if a local government, if the owner of an airport wants to restrict how its own airport is used, it can only do so if it meets these criteria. The restriction must be reasonable in the circumstances of that airport. It must be carefully tailored to the unique local needs. It must be based upon data which supports that need and it must not be unduly restrictive of interstate commerce. Now these are good legal principles to keep in mind, but, but I, I want you to leave with one important piece of information from these four points. Just because another airport has done something doesn't mean the same thing can be done at your airport because of these principles, because of these principles of needing to tailor the, any restriction to the local needs and show that, that the, the data for this community supports the restriction. So we're going to come back to this over and over again over the course of the evening. So one other way of looking at the power of the city and the power of the county with respect to airports is to think of sort of three different areas. When it comes to the skies, the FAA has almost complete control. <clears throat> when it comes to the airport itself, what goes on on the ground on the airport, the county has largely, but not entirely, a great deal of control. And when it comes to what happens outside the airport, that's the city's responsibility. So as we go through a bunch of options here, keep in mind these three different entities. And keep in mind whether the kind of options we're talking about are ones that affect aircraft in flight, whether they affect how the airport operates, or whether they affect what goes on near the airport. 
Now, I'm going to spend just a couple seconds on here. Good news, by the way, this presentation will be online for, for those of you who, who I know are quickly taking uh, uh, selfies. Can I get in the middle? So, um, but, 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 but seriously, if you want to get the actual data, it will be online, so you don't, you don't have to remember all of it. What, what I want to leave with, from this slide with just a couple points, which is there are a couple of federal statutes that govern how airports operate and how the federal government regulates airports. The one we're going to spend a lot of time on is the very last one here, which is the Airport Noise and Capacity Act of 1990. And we're going to talk about that because that changed fundamentally the relationship between airports and the federal government. And it gave the federal government considerably more control than it had back to the beginning of aviation. Until the beginning of aviation, until 1990, the amount of local airport owner control over airports was much greater than it is today. There are also a series of regulations. We're not going to get into these in any great detail beyond the last one, which are the regulations that implement that last statute, the 1990 statute, and tell how airports can, in fact, adopt restrictions. And let me talk about that for just one second. Those regulations are called Part 161. Has anybody ever heard of Part 161? I see a couple nods. OK, good. Um, this is the set of federal regulations that control whether an airport can impose noise or access restrictions. Noise or access restrictions. Those are really important words. That is, whether an air, this, this set of regulations controls whether an airport can restrict what goes on at the airport for the purposes of noise, or whether an airport can restrict what goes on at the airport for the purpose of limiting access to the airport. These are obviously two very key parts of how an airport might be regulated. So it is a very key set of regulations. The regulations adopted in 1990 made a distinction based upon how noisy aircraft were. And without spending an entire session on that, let me simplify it to say that FAA approval is today required for any noise or access restriction that affects the current generation of jet aircraft. Let me say that again. Today, if an airport wants to impose an access restriction or a noise restriction that affects the current generation of jet aircraft, it requires FAA approval. Now, that wasn't the case before 1990. And between 1990 and 2016, there were a couple of exceptions. But that's the case today. And if an airport wants to get FAA approval, they go through a very complicated, very expensive, very extensive process. That's the good news. The bad news is that since 1990, no airport has imposed a restriction on the current generation of jet aircraft. There are many restrictions out there. How many of you know about restrictions at airports like John Wayne, Sacramento, San Francisco, or, or, um, or Orange County, John Wayne, uh, many, many other airports, including this airport, have restrictions in place that were in place before 1990. Since 1990, only one airport has attempted to restrict the noisiest generation of jet aircraft. Those jet aircraft don't exist anymore. No airport has been successful in imposing a restriction on the current generation. And only a very small number of airports even have even attempted. And the reason being that the FAA has made it crystal clear that it will never approve a restriction on the current generation of jet aircraft. Now, we can try. And airports have come in and tried. And the FAA has said, why are you wasting your time trying? And sometimes the airports have said, because the community has demanded that we try, and we try hard, and we try harder, and we keep trying to impose a restriction. And the FAA says, fine, try. We won't officially tell you that we'll say no. But here are all our policy papers. And we think you're wasting your time. And remarkably, they were right. So three airports in the country have tried to impose restrictions, Burbank, Van Nuys, and LAX. And all three have failed. <clears throat> many other have started. Many other have talked about it. And then they've gotten the dose of reality that the FAA won't approve it. So it's important to keep this baseline in mind and keep in mind that when we're talking about restrictions on, air, on airport operations, almost all of them, 
predated 1990. Now, I want to talk about one other set of federal laws um, before we switch from federal to state, and, and Sarah's going to take over from there. <clears throat> Grant assurances are this really strange set of laws that aren't really laws, but contracts. When an airport takes federal money, and almost all airports do, the airport owner signs a contract in exchange for their grant of federal money. And the contract contains what are called grant assurances, a set of 39 promises that the airport owner makes to the federal government, saying, here's how I will operate the airport. Now, these are not laws in the sense that Congress has passed them, but they are binding contractual commitments, in this case from San Diego County, to the federal government. So they are binding on the county. Really important to keep in mind grant assurances because they relate to the use of the airport, they relate to how the airport is developed, how the airport is planned, how the airport is built, and federal law requires the, the, the county to sign those grant assurances before it can get federal money. And no big surprise, the county gets federal money every year. Every year they sign the same contract. So it's important to keep in mind that while there may be things Folks have said to us all the time, I, I never saw that in federal law. I, there's no law. I looked, I looked all over. I did my whole Google search and found not a single law on that subject. And the answer is that's correct. But the grant assurances bind the county to do certain things. Now I'm going to talk very briefly about some state requirements and then turn it over to Sarah. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on the issue of state requirements because in the current context they're not particularly critical um, because the state really has only minimal oversight responsibilities over, over the airport. But the state aeronautics code does provide procedures for uh, amending or requiring and then amending an airport permit for some of the master plan projects. And we can, if you want, later get into more detail as to what those, what those requirements are. The aeronautics code also requires city council approval, but that approval cannot be subject to the voter approval that Sarah's going to talk about later because it's a state law, not a, not a city ordinance. And Sarah's going to get in a little bit more detail into some of the issues having to do with local approval. So Sarah, I think, now that was <coughs> the equivalent of about a semester in law school. So, so there will be a quiz at the end of this. And those of you who pass get a free semester. Isn't that right, free semester of law school? Right. Sarah, it's all yours. Hey, you're handling my changes right to the yes so Celia also asked me to remind you again that there are comment cards at the end of each aisle I believe so again if you don't feel comfortable when we get to the Q&A part um, uh, coming up to the podium please feel free to fill those out uh, so one of the things that we did during our presentation to the City Council is we talked about some of the local land use principles um, that apply particularly in this situation. And I'm going to quickly go over, go over our conclusions, particularly with regard to section 2153.015, which is the initiative uh, measure that was passed by the Carlsbad City Council several years ago. The requirements of the conditional use permit associated with the airport, and finally the airport land use commission requirements. First of all, with regard to voter approval, so let's look at this language again. I'm sure all of you have read this about a million times, because I have to say I have too. Um, but I just want to read it one more time. The City Council should not approve any zone change, general plan amendment, or any other legislative enactment necessary to authorize expansion of any airport in the city, nor shall the city commence any action or spend any funds preparatory to or in anticipation of such approvals without having first, first been authorized to do so by a majority vote of the qualified electors of the city voting in election for such purposes. So that's a mouthful. And the only way that I was able to parse this out um, as I was reviewing it is to do a graph or a chart, I should say. And the way I look at this is the first question you have to ask is, is there an expansion of the airport that is being proposed by the master plan? If the answer is no, then you go right down to, we don't think there's a vote that would be required associated with any kind of activity in the master plan that doesn't include an expansion. If the answer to your question of is there an expansion is yes, then you still have to ask the question, 
Is there a zone change general plan amendment or other legislative enactment necessary to authorize it? If your answer to that question is yes, then we think a vote would be required. If your answer to that question is no, then we don't think a vote would be required. So let's go through each element of that. Peter? Um, and first of all, I think it's important to understand, and obviously the, the master plan itself has a lot of detail in it, but essentially what the new master plan is contemplating is various improvements in the airfield, runway relocation and extension, certain facilities improvements, and with regard to land acquisition, we acknowledge that in some cases they say they have no plan to acquire any additional land, and then every once in a while, in the master plan itself, there's language that says, well, we may, we may need to acquire land for additional runway protection zones. And um, they are somewhat inconsistent about that topic in a lot of the documents. And, and incidentally, that's one of the things that we said in our comments on the draft EIR and the master plan. So our conclusion, and I know you're going to all throw tomatoes at me, <laughs> but our conclusion has um, is that we don't think that what's being proposed in the master plan constitutes an expansion for purposes of this uh, initiative language. And let me tell you the three reasons that we come to that conclusion. The first one is that when analyzing uh, language in, in an ordinance, in, in statute, one of the principles is that you'd like to preserve the validity of the ordinance. What we're concerned about is that if you, if you determine that expansion means something um, different than expanding the actual airport boundary that you run into a number of federal preemption issues and we can get into the, more of that in the Q&A context but um, suffice it to say that that's what our concern is with regard to um, federal preemption and the definition of expansion with regard to airport boundary. Second, the historical context of the initiative measure was that it was proposed during a period of time when the county was proposing a, an extension of existing runway and also a new runway. And our view is that when that initiative measure was being proposed, it really was in the context of a serious extension of a runway and an extension of the airport boundaries. And finally, in the legislative context, there's language um, during the period of time when the city council actually approved the initiative measure instead of having it go to a vote of the people, where there was language from the city attorney where he, where he actually opined and said uh, that he believed that the term expansion meant expansion of airport boundaries. So that's the reason that we came out with a definition of expansion the way we did. And I'm gonna stop here for a minute because I wanna point out, um, and I know a lot of people have raised this question, there are a lot of maps floating around, okay? And we acknowledge that, and they're, they're not always all that clear, but I'm just going to show you a couple of them. This is, this is a map of the airport boundary that is in the current airport land use compatibility plan and is also shown in the uh, master plan update. And so just notice that um, particularly the, the area that on, the, um, on this side of El Camino that uh, you know, some people have asked, is that part of the airport? Is it not part of the airport? What is that? Um, the, other, the other thing I would point out is that this area, and we don't have a map up here, but the, the area in yellow, um, with, re with the exception of the runway protection zones that go out from the area in yellow, um, is generally the area that is shown in any of the conditional use permit maps that you see. And then finally, next slide. Um, let me also show you, this is the airport property map that comes from the current airport layout plan that is the document that's submitted by the airport to the federal government and has all kinds of purposes for um, federal regulatory requirements. But notice that you have the airport property map and at the top the, ex the extent of existing, oops, back up, the extent, here one more the extent of existing airport property, that, that area, which, which is basically consistent with the previous map I showed you. But if you're confused about which map is being used, you're, you're not alone. 
And um, that was one of the questions that we also asked when we commented on the master plan and the draft EIR. We wanted the county to clarify what it meant when it was talking about airport boundary in particular. So it'll be interesting to see if we get an answer to that question. Okay, so our conclusion, um, going through my chart again, is that even if you make the argument that yes, there is an airport expansion, you still have to go to that next question, which is, is there a zone change general plan amendment or other legislative act necessary to authorize the expansion? In our view, and I think I will, in the interest of time, I won't go into the detail here, but our view is that there is no zone change, there's no general plan amendment, and there's no other legislative enactment that is necessary to authorize the expansion of the airport. Okay, with regard to the conditional use permit, and again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, um, but the conditional use permit, the, the permitted uses in the conditional use permit are really dictated by what's on table one of the conditional use permit, and it's a laundry list of, um, of uses. Interestingly enough, the, the runway is not listed on the list of conditional uses, and we don't know, the answer, we don't know why that's the case. Um, but what it does do, it says development shall occur substantially as shown unless otherwise noted. Well, um, the, the permitted uses identify a whole series of uses. They don't show exactly where they all are, and, um, and it's not particularly specific with, with regard to what, what is supposed to be where, what the square footages of buildings are. Um, suffice it to say there's a lot of flexibility in that conditional use permit. Um, can you, you want to go on to the next one? So our conclusion with regard to the conditional use permit is that there really are no new uses that are being proposed by the new master plan, that the CUP allows a lot of flexibility with regard to the uses, and there's no expansion of the airport facility, so that therefore there's no conditional use permit amendment that would be required. And even if there were a CUP amendment required, we still don't think that would trigger 2153.015 because 2153.015 applies to a legislative enactment. Uh, a CUP amendment, in our view, is not a legislative enactment. It's actually a quasi-judicial -judici action, not a legislative enactment. And therefore, coming full circle, we think that even if a CUP amendment were required, that it still wouldn't trigger a vote of the people. Okay, finally, with regard to the Airport Land Use Commission, uh, many of you probably know how this, this body operates, but what the master plan update has said is that the county will need to update its 2010 Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan when it updates its master plan. And state law requires the city to have its general plan be consistent with the Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan. However, that update is not required for the airport master plan implementation. That update is just required for the city of Carlsbad to be consistent with state law requirements. So the city of Carlsbad could choose not to update its general plan and not be functioning consistent with state law, but it wouldn't mean that the master plan activities couldn't go forward. So with that, I'm going to, oh, sorry, CEQA, one more, one more chart. Um, uh, Jason already mentioned to you that the county has said that it is going to recirculate certain sections of the draft EIR, and we, that was news to us today, so we're glad to hear that. Um, but as you know, um, we have submitted a pretty significant comment letter on the draft EIR, and we'll look forward to seeing what these new drafts are that, um, that are sort of responses, frankly, probably to some of our comments. Okay, I wish I had a drum roll right now because it's the time you've all been waiting for. It's the time to get up and ask questions. So um, we don't have an actual time limit. What we do have is an ability for you to line up right here. If you don't feel comfortable speaking at a podium and you just wanna make a comment or a question, pass your sheet, your comment card out to the outside of the aisle and a staff member will pick it up for you and we'll advance that question for you. Okay, so come on. And just as a reminder also, this is intended as Q&A part one. So these are questions and comments that relate to uh, this first part of the presentation. As we start looking at strategies going forward, we want to reserve that for the second part of Q&A. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Michael Schertzer. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, KKNR for coming this evening and for Cilio organizing such a, a great opportunity for us to have a discussion. You, you completed your uh, uh, review. Uh, you didn't get into the quasi-judicial aspect of uh, CUP, and that's what I want to touch on. I'd like your take on uh, my proposal, a proposal, that the city of Carlsbad request that the county submit an amended application to obtain approval for any change in the B2 airport designation as required in its operating permit. So it would go through the Planning Commission and ultimately through uh, Carlsbad Municipal Code to the City Council. The City Council would also make a, uh, an administrative or quasi-judicial decision. So the reason I bring this up, it's a narrow focus, uh, early stage issue, but I find that the uh, county's uh, explanation of that they're not bound by uh, CUP, I find that to be uh, very weak in their, uh, in their master plan update. So I'd like uh, some comments about that possibility, recognizing that it's a very early on issue, but it would open things up. Yeah, I could hear you, but you, you're now, not. Now you can't. Okay. Yeah, better. Um, a, lot, a lot of questions in there, and they're all, believe me, they're, every one of those is a really good question. And I'm going to turn to Peter when we start talking about the airport classifications. Okay. But let me see if I can um, answer a few of the questions that you've asked. Right. First of all, with regard to the uh, quasi-judicial versus um, legislative, my view is that the property is already zoned what it needs to be zoned um, and, and that, that that would be the legislative act when you actually rezone the property. The conditional use permit or an amendment to the conditional use permit is the quasi-judicial action. Correct. So if, uh, the if you were to say to the county, come in and apply for an amendment to the conditional use permit to change the classification, I think that's still a quasi-judicial action. Right. Okay. Um, and do you want to go to talk about airport classification? But decisions could be made on a quasi-judicial action. That's, as, that's right. Right. Um, doesn't and have to be. So, I'm not talking about any legislative action. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So then, so let's say a decision is made on the quasi-judicial action. Um, the county, as you've rightly pointed out, has, has said that it has essentially immunity from local governmental regulations. Right. And the research that we've done indicates that um, essentially that immunity exists and that by subjecting themselves to the conditional use permit all these years, that, that we haven't fi found any sort of estoppel arguments or, or other ways that they're sort of a stop from making that argument. It's a great argument and it's an argument that certainly in court one would make. Whether it's successful or not, Hard to know. I don't want to get too technical, yeah. but can I just mention what the uh, <clears throat> county submitted along with CUP? Uh, they submitted a uh, uh, their policy statement, and they said they would be following their policy statement, which was F20. And um, that in that statement, um, they were submitting their application in accordance with the board. Board of Supervisors Policy F20, describing that, quote, the development of a mutually acceptable conditional use permit is appropriate to the future development of existing airport property. Then the policy F20 itself states, county staff will consult with the planning agency within whose jurisdiction the facility is to be located, and that, quote, project development shall conform with all reasonable requirements of such agencies. Now, that was attached with their CUP, Table 1, the yep. whole COP and the CUP and their conditions. So I look at that as uh, basically waiving their right to intergovernmental immunity because they've been so specific with uh, what they would be obligated to do. Right. It's a very good point. So do you want to talk about yeah, classification? Let me, let me talk if I can about airport classifications. And this sure. gets real technical real quickly. I'm sure you understand it, but for the benefit of the other members of the audience. Um, airports are classified based upon the size of aircraft they can accommodate. 
and there are letters and numbers, and I'm not going to get into all the, all the calculations, but the airport is currently classified as a B2 airport, and part of the master plan is to increase the size of aircraft that are allowed to operate here. That's a big deal for reasons I don't have to explain. Now, the real question, first of all, is does the city have any authority, any role in the decision to change the classification? The answer to that one is actually pretty easy, no. The city has no control over that. Now, interestingly, the county only has limited control. And here's what federal law says, that the county is required to accommodate what are known as the critical design aircraft. That is, the largest aircraft that uses the airport more than 500 times a year. The, the, the county is required to provide facilities for that size aircraft. The question is, what is that? And, and there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem here because the county would like to accommodate larger aircraft and it has project, produced a forecast that says, surprise, that they think they will have more than 500 aircraft that are larger than can currently be accommodated at the airport. And the real question is the chicken and egg. That is, are those aircraft coming regardless of whether the facilities are enlarged at this airport or are they going to come only because the facilities are enlarged? That is a negotiation process between the county and the FAA. And the city has no role to play in that, unfortunately. And so there's, there, there are a lot of technical components underneath this, but it's a question we have posed in our comments on the master plan because we think it's a really critical component of the chicken and egg. That is, is the county trying to induce? Is the county trying to encourage larger aircraft or are those aircraft coming here anyway? Okay, thank you. Gary Nessam, um, my question is, what would be the downside of the city of Carlsbad annexing the airport into the city of Carlsbad? Wouldn't change the ownership of the airport, it'd still be the county of San Diego, but that would make us the lead agency instead of the county of San Diego, I assume, if, if it occurred at some point in time, if we were successful at an annexing into the city of Carlsbad. And this, um, that would give a little more control. They'd be the lead agency instead of the county. And since this is occurring now, there are some changes occurring. And in 10 years, there might be some more changes occurring. If we don't attempt to annex it, then the changes would then go through the county of San Diego as a lead agency in 10 years, instead of coming to the city of Carlsbad first. In addition, probably the costs of your firm and all the other costs of this hearing are being borne by the city of Carlsbad. And probably if this was the county of San Diego conducting this hearing, they would be borne by the airport owner. So by us annexing it, we'd become the lead agency and all the costs of administering these hearings would be borne by the owner of the airport, which would be the county of San Diego. So something we should have worked on some time ago is annexing the airport into the city of Carlsbad to be the lead agency and get our costs reimbursed. I don't think it would make any change over what's going to occur here, but it would give us, when I look at your pie chart, where the county has control, it would give the city a little more control, not a substantial amount, it's all FAA control, but it would pay to start that. And that's more of a city staff question, I think, than the attorney's question. Well, I can, I can probably answer the first part pretty easily, which is the airport is within the city. The city has already annexed the airport. Now, the I city. think you're asking a slightly different question. Let me, let, let me see if I can uh, take the uh, uh, prerogative to, to revise your question, if I may, which is there, it is, in fact, annexed in the city. It is in the city. I think you're probably asking about the city taking over ownership no. of the airport, no. which is a very different story. That's okay, if you're not, then, then good. Then the answer is very simple, which is it's already in the city and we are where we are today because it is owned and operated by the county but lies within the boundary of the city. All right, then I'd follow to if we, the downside of attempting to obtain ownership over it, which I have no clue as to whether there's a downside of owning it, the city owning it. Yeah, well, and, and you, there may be some downsides and certainly would be very interesting if the city were to own it and without sounding too snarky, if you will, um, in order to own it, somebody has to sell it to you. 
Um, and so yeah. I, 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 I <laughs> would be at a, a little price. surprised. <laughs> at a reasonable price, yeah. I, I mean, we don't have to continue this, but, but, but uh, I, I don't know that the airport's for sale right now. Good evening. I'm Susie Thorley. And I'd like to get closer. Can you hear me now? Thank you. I'm Susie Thorley, and I'd like to thank you for being here. This is great that there's some open dialogue. Appreciate it. Um, I just would like to point out the intent of the Citizens Initiative in 1980. It was brought about by the county's desire to lengthen the existing runway and to put in a second runway. The citizens didn't want that. They didn't want the airport to get larger or have more aircraft traffic unless they made that decision, the voters. I don't care whether you call it an expansion, an extension, inside, outside, footprint, boundaries, fence line, they didn't want the airport to get larger. It's not about, it is all about the intent of the initiative. What the citizens in, did they intend when they wrote this initiative? Again, I want to stress, what was the intent? It's unfortunate that the former attorney opined that it meant going outside the property. I don't believe that was the intent of the initiative. In the city has, in the past, historically, supported no expansion of the airport. For example, resolution number 1692 in 1970, the council listed eight resolves in opposing expansion of the Palomar Airport, including a substantial effect on the quality of life within the city. It would have a very del deleterious, harmful effect on the quality of life and property values. Planes creating a high noise level would create a threat of accident and injury to persons and property. It would overburden roads and public facilities as well as ecological ethics. The council stated its unalterable opposition to the expansion of Palomar in any way to accommodate medium and long range transport. The city was very clear on its position early on what the, county, the council's position was and should be to protect its citizens. I've not found a resolution since that time which would change this resolution. In 1972, the Planning Commission on Resolution 849, opposing jet airport facilities at Camp Pendleton and opposing major expansion of Palomar Airport. It outlined numerous reasons why Palomar should not become a major jet facility and concluded such a facility would be contrary to the best interests of the public. In 1984, the council resolution number 7530 offered its position that McClellan Palomar be retained as a general aviation facility. To quote, city council policy is that McClellan Palomar Airport continue to be designated as a general aviation facility and the city council opposes any expansion of said airport. Obviously in 79 and 80, the citizens wanted to make sure that they had a say if the airport got bigger. Doesn't that loop back all to the intent? Has the city's position changed from these resolutions? And is the city promoting business interest over protecting its citizens? Sorry. The, thank you for co your comments. I don't know if there's a quit. I don't know that I can answer the question about what the well, city I guess you can't. It's the council's. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I, just, I can respond a little bit to that, and that is there, um, there is a whole body of law about when we talk about what we call legislative intent, et cetera, but without getting into that, I do want to point out that 
Um, there seems to have been a, a community presumption or something that I'm not sure is accurate, and that is that if we had a vote in Carlsbad, that it would bind more than just the city, right? So typically, we wouldn't have any ability to take a vote in the city of Carlsbad that would bind another organization or agency. If we took a vote right now on something happening, um, we couldn't bind, for instance, the city of Vista. So we could, with that vote, let's just pretend that there was something that met the requirements of having a vote, you could certainly certainly say we've had a citizens initiative and the citizens voted no and that ties the hands of the city council of the city of Carlsbad but it's not clear under the law how we would then use that and translate it into binding the hands of the county so um, it's a much more complex issue but I do appreciate all of the intention that went into that we've looked uh, for a long time at the legislative history ourselves um, and it does have some input um, but it doesn't necessarily make it controlling in this complex legal environment Hi, my name is Rich Breyer. Um, I want to thank you guys for having this. This is great. Um, my question, I have a couple. Um, purpose and need. I think you kind of already, with the chicken and egg thing, kind of already explored that. But I'm just wondering if we could get staff and your opinion on purpose and need of this expansion, extension. That's one question. The next question would be navigation uh, easements. Um, if there is modifications to the the, the runway, um, therefore, you know, the, the, the leading lights that lead you into it have to get moved, things like that, does that get renegoti renegotiated? Abrogation rights. Um, the last one would be, I like how you talked about zoning and what the city and what we can do to limit the growth around the airport. Maybe we can't touch the property, but we can stop it so rent a cars and whatever else that needs to be with, the, you know, the thing. I would like to see, hear your guys' opinion, city staff and yours, on that because uh, I think that's one way of, I think it's a good point when you brought that up. And so that's what I got for now. Let me start with your last point. Can okay. you hold that point? Okay. Because when we get to the second half of the conversation tonight, I'd like you to bring that up again. Okay. Because I, th I think it's a really important topic that we need to talk no, about. No, when you mentioned it, you know, a m couple months ago, I. I keyed in on that. I'm like, good, well, that's good. A, yeah. don't, don't forget it. Okay. okay. I won't. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, now, let, let, let me go back to your first two points about purpose and need for the expansion. Um, I don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you kind of did in, the, in that kind first of meeting. Did. Yeah. I kind of did, and I probably went too far, right? Um, no, maybe not. <laughs> it is not clear to us, reviewing the master plan no. and the EIR, which comes first. It appears... And, you know, we can put these in all those air quotes and all the rest, but it appears to us that a significant component of the desire for a longer runway is to attract business. Right. Okay? Now, uh, the reason I say it appears is that both the master plan and the EIR are, are a bit, uh, what, what's, what are we going to say, fuzzy, ambiguous <laughs> on that. I agree. Um, and given the data we've seen, it doesn't seem to support the argument that this is needed well, because they're using the 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 the, against, the it's safety driven, but um, C three and D three planes are landing and taking off there, so let's, it's it's not a safety. Let's be thing. really really careful about the safety card. Okay. Okay. Um, everybody likes playing the safety card because right. nobody wants things that are unsafe. But let's be let's be crystal clear. The airport today can accommodate larger aircraft than B two. Right. It can. It is. Should it? is a question that is decided on a case-by-case -case basis, literally, by the pilot in command of the aircraft and the air traffic controller at that moment. If a pilot says, I am flying a 747 and I want to land here, and the air traffic controller says, you will destroy this airport and your airplane in the process, and he lands nevertheless, he may be subject to all kinds of enforcement, but he has landed. And he has made, in my view, a very poor judgment. So the fact that aircraft larger than B-2 are landing here is a function of decisions that pilots have made. Now, it is routine for pilots to make decisions to go to an airport that's just a little bit too small. Hence, B-2 maybe to C-2, maybe B-2 to B-3. That's not that uncommon. That, that is for, for an airport to sort of slide in, its, in, in the size of the aircraft slightly. The fact that the master plan is proposing going from a from a B-2 all the way to a D 
Three. Three, I'm sorry, yeah. I think it was D3. D3. All the way to D3 suggests to me at least that there may be, that the chicken and egg question may in fact have been resolved by the county. And that is that the county may be trying to induce those aircraft to use this airport. Now, that may or may not be significant from a legal perspective. It may be significant from a policy perspective. So that's my own view of what I've read, but it certainly is a good question. And we have posed that, by the way, to the county. Yeah, so I, I as well. But can I ask one more? I mean, or I know you didn't answer my, my avigation one. You can do that one. Let, let me deal with avigation easement yeah. because I'm not exactly sure I understand what you're asking. Um, an avigation easement is a property right Right. that a landowner grants to the airport, in this case to the county, allowing overflights. Right. Um, every avigation easement re reads slightly differently. It, it, sometimes mm -hmm. avigation easements say they're based upon a particular runway alignment, a particular runway size. More often than not, it's much broader than that. And so I haven't read the specific avigation easements in this community. There's a Bressy Ranch case that was. Yeah, yeah. I suspect that the avigation easement is broad enough that it probably takes care of any aircraft that would land even at a. At a yeah, I think it does area. say that. Um, but, 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 but one would have to read those specifically. And even ones that haven't been created yet. Well, the ones that have been created. <laughs> I mean, look, if I were the county, I'd try to create an avigation easement that would allow overflight of the property. Uh, limitless, right? Right, right? And and they pay for that right. Uh, they pay the property owner for that right. And so I don't know specifically what they say in this community, but generally they're drafted broadly enough that they're not tied to the specific airport configuration at the time. The so the configuration is. won't change that ruling? The, the, the only thing it would change is if the entire runway alignment changed. Which the they're talking runway. about doing. It, and, and in which case it's possible. I don't want to give okay. you legal advice no, on no, what I'm, your rights are. I'm not asking for that. <clears throat> but, but, but I think uh, it's not likely to be a particularly productive avenue. Okay. So my last one, and it's probably more for you, sir, is about the, the existing landfills. And, you know, they, there's, there's, there's manifold reserve to picking up um, methane gases. And, and I, so I did a little research, and I read about Title 40. And, you know, you don't touch, you can't touch that without, you know, somebody blessing it. And I think it's like maybe Cal, C, you know, I don't know. It, there's, a, there's an agency overlooking it. So if that's the case, then how are they going to go out and drill pile, you know, through that? I mean, with, I mean. Right. I think we have um, a, a member of county staff who was, or sorry, city staff, I apologize, who was going to be prepared to answer the technical questions okay. about the landfill. Okay. Um, my understanding is that it's been looked at uh, numerous times and that what they're proposing is something that's possible, but I'm not a, uh, an I'm not engineer, saying that it's not so. po anything's possible, yeah. but you would have to, what I was saying is that in Title 40, when I read that, it said that you can't modify a closed landfill without approval, so they can just go ask for approval and then they'll just grandfather it, or I mean, that's what I'm asking. That's what they're proposing to do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And I'll ask my question again. Good evening. I'd like to thank you very much for being here as well. Uh, my name is Stephanie Jackal, and I'm uh, actually a resident of Vista. And I don't have a question so much as a plea to you and the city of Carlsbad to, uh, in, in your deliberations, going forward, not forget the communities outside Carlsbad. Um, I am representing the, the uh, residents of Vista, and as your excellent letter to the county points out, uh, the master plan and especially the draft EIR are deficient in many ways. Um, planes don't just go up in the air and fly over the airport, they fly away and come from away to the airport. So speaking for those of us in VISTA, I would say that the draft EIR utterly, totally fails because it utterly fails to consider the impact of planes flying over communities outside VISTA. There's no mention of that anywhere in the draft EIR. <clears throat> Much less the impact to be expected with these newer, bigger planes that they're talking about. 
Those of us in Vista, along with Carlsbad uh, residents, experience very loud, very low airplane overflights at all hours of the day and night. And I know you just got through saying there's no way to make these things mandatory. Um, my house and garden suffer from the black gunk from the fuel particu particulates. And thus, my house's property value and my health will ultimately be affected. So please remember those communities outside Carlsbad in your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Graham Thorley, the not so good part of Susie Thorley. <laughs> uh, I want to try to help Cecilia and can, yeah, I want to try to help Cecilia answer what she, the little quadrundrum, quadrundrum that she had two questions ago. Are you aware that CUP 172 is a county document, county owned document, not a city owned document? The county presented it to Carlsbad when they looked to get their conditional use permit for the airport. The Carlsbad took that document and removed the runway from what the county had presented, gave it back to the county, and they agreed that the runway would never, ever be extended. Are you aware of that? I don't think I've ever seen a document where the county agreed that it would never be extended. Well, we have it. Well. Also, uh, It would be nice if you'd submit that to the city. Oh, we have. You asked us to help you on your document search, and we gave you the, our documents. So, also, in April of 1984, the County of San Diego voted and issued a joint powers agreement to Carlsbad, Oceanside, Vista, San Marcos. Do you have that agreement? We do. Yep. Now, I don't, we are trying to find out what happened from the cities, and we can't find any information. So if you could provide that to us, we would be... Most well, and my, my understanding is that the city never approved that JP. the cities, all cities, all, four, all five cities. Right. With regard to Carlsbad, my understanding is that, the, right. that Carlsbad did okay. not approve so that So we'll JPA. have to do the search yep. in Vista and Oceanside. Okay. Also, uh, I question Carlsbad's mayor on his latest statement that he uh, made in the Carlsbad Life news, newsletter that uh, he publicized the link on his Facebook page in which he was very proactive how the airport is going to help the businesses of North County, but never mentioned once about his residents that are going to lose 20 to 30 percent of their property value as a result of the airport expansion. So, uh, also, I'd like to leave you with, uh, got to move this around a little bit. Uh, so, the late Associate Supreme Court Justice Antonin, Antonin uh, Scalia stated when he was asked, What is most important? when he decides a case, his answer were, was, words have meaning. Carlsbad's previous 1970 to 20, 2013 words have meaning. And what he actually said was, it's what did the words mean to the people who ratified the Bill of Rights or ratified the Constitution as opposed to today. And based upon 23, no, 33 years of documentation that we have that says the public in Carlsbad 
do not want the airport extended. That is the intent of what CUP was all about and the ordinance. It isn't that some attorney opined and definition of opine is, it's his personal opinion. It's got nothing to do with the law. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, why don't we finish up with these last two questions and then we'll take a short break before we go into part two. Thank you. All right. Can you guys hear me back there? Okay. Let me tell you, I got a question and I got a comment. Probably the comment is the answer to my question. My question is, I've been in this airport since 1974, and I almost lived by the airport since 1979. And what the, is the holdup of this airport expansion? What's the holdup? Well, my comment is, what well, because people are afraid of the noise. The two-thirds of people back here are all gray hair like I am. In five years, they need a hearing aid to hear what they have to feel. What are they complaining about? I got a 94-year-old mother lives like Alga. I can talk to her next to her ear. She can't hear me. So you folks, don't worry about the noise. You ain't going to hear it in five years. Can we please model some really great community engagement and be polite in this meeting? I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, can, can you hear me? OK. Vicki Syage, and I have a follow-up on um, the purpose and need question, because Mr. Kirch, you brought up a very good point. You mentioned that um, the FAA requires that an airport get larger if an aircraft use, um, uses it more than 500 times per year, correct? Um, and that would require the need. And that we've also um, said that there isn't a safety issue at Palomar. We've all agreed that Palomar's safe. So therefore, um, and when you look in the city master, uh, the county's master plan, they've agreed that a D3 type plane only lands at that airport maybe once a week. So let's give them 50 times a year. So we're only at 10% of what the FAA requires for us to expand. So therefore, it seems to me we've logically come to the conclusion there is no need for an expansion. Um, and there is no need for expansion based upon safety. Therefore, what can we as a city do? What can you guys advise our city to do to stop what seems like a bunch of wasted money to have a build it and they'll come? which is not required by the FAA, and there's no advantage to, to the city as a resident. So what, what, are, what can we do? What can, you legally, what can we as a city legally do to stop this waste of taxpayer money? Does that make sense? It, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, so thank you. And, and it's, a, it's an issue that we raised in our comments on the, on the um, draft EIR and in the master plan. Um, here's, here's the challenge we have. Um, let's suppose for a moment we all agree with your statement because I'm not going to argue whether, whether it's accurate or not. Um, the, the problem is that the county as the owner of the airport has the prerogative if it chooses to m enhance the facility. If it wanted to paint the terminal a different color, it can do that. If it wants to have more tie downs for aircraft, it can do that and so on. And so simply arguing in the, uh, in the comments on the EIR and the comments on the master plan that there's no current need for the, the extension of the runway is a really important and valid point. But it doesn't get to the second piece which I think the county has been fairly candid about, and I say fairly because it was a little bit opaque, but fairly candid that they want the extension of the runway in order to attract economic activity, in order to attract businesses to this part of the county. Now, that's a different set of issues it, as to whether that's good or bad, but it really doesn't go to the legal authority of the county to do that or the city to oppose that because that's really a policy call. Is this good for the airport? Is it good for the county? Is it good for the city? And so that's the, the what, what we really want to do in our comments on the EIR and our comments on the master plan is to force the county to be candid 
Are they really doing this because they must do it? We believe the answer is no. Are they really doing this because they want to do it? And we think the answer is yes. And, and, and we think the county should be more transparent about that. So let me ask a follow-up to that. What rights do we have as, a citi as citizens and what, how can you help our city to force a government agency such as the county to be honest and accurate in these documents? Are, are, there, is there, you know, are they just allowed to pull numbers out of the air? Are they allowed to just fudge and fib because it, it is the means to their end? Um, is there law and guidance that says a county entity must state things truthfully and fact factually, and if they don't, do we have the legal means to stop? Because you've said yourself that that document is full of holes and contradictions and partial truths, and a partial truth is by definition a lie. So. So let me, let me try to answer that one. First okay. of all, with regard to, remember there are two documents that we commented on, right? The master right. plan and the draft EIR. Um, with regard to the draft EIR, which is required by CEQA, uh, if, you know, the avenue is a challenge in court, if somebody views the document is inadequate, inadequate in, and one of the things it has to do is state things truth, truthfully. The law requires that. So that's that's the... CEQA Avenue, if that issue is there. With regard to the master plan itself, that's a trickier issue because the master plan isn't necessarily even required to be prepared. It's up to the county to prepare a master plan. So they can and prepare a document that's not required? I mean, it's, it's an interesting. Here's, here's, here, here's a dilemma, and I, and I, appreci <laughs> I appreciate um, your question because I think it really goes to uh, you'll never hear a lawyer say this again, but the limits of the law. Um, and that is that the law says that a master plan is a plan for what the airport owner wants to do. That's what its purpose, okay? Now, that master plan must be subjected to public scrutiny. I haven't gotten to the EIR yet. And that public scrutiny is designed at a policy level to, to, to talk about, just like we're doing here tonight, is this a good idea what the airport owner wants to do? And the county is required to have a series of hearings. The county is required to subject their master plan to review by a bunch of agencies and by the public. Um, it, it may sound like Civics 101 for me to say this, but the reason that there's lots of public input into a master plan process is to generate exactly what you're talking about, the kind of debate that says, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Is this a good idea? Hold it. Are they telling us the truth? And that kind of back and forth dialogue is really important. But in terms of planning, the law doesn't provide a lot of protection to say at the end of the day the policymakers have decided on this plan and some of the members of the community think it's a lousy plan. Now Sarah talked about the, the legal avenues available if there are if factual inaccuracies in their reporting of what the impacts of the plan are, and there are lots of vehicles for that, but we need to distinguish here between, between the plan itself and the environmental impacts of the plan. So we have no legal remedy if the plan is a fabrication, but we have legal remedy if the supporting documents are fabrication. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I'm likening it to me, if I, I if I go to buy a house, I have to be truthful about my financial. Why are you smiling? Well, I, 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 <laughs> We're I'm, actually I'm, contemplating it. I'm sorry. Responded <laughs> so if, because if I, it's actually a good. Let, let me let me propose it a different way. Okay, I agree. If you buy a house, you got to tell the truth. Okay? Right. But suppose so you say to your daughter, "I plan to take you out to dinner the night after tomorrow night." Okay. <laughs> and you don't really plan to. You're just doing that so that she does her homework. Okay, now, at the end of the day, have you lied? Yes. Maybe you haven't lied. Maybe you've stretched it. Maybe you're using your plan to accomplish something else. I know it's a horrible analogy. I apologize. But what I'm getting at is, is a plan is a plan. Okay, a plan is what the county wants to accomplish. The reason that the law requires an EIR to be prepared on the plan is to disclose to the public what the consequences are of the plan. 
Now, you and I may, may agree or may disagree that the plan is rotten or that it's, that it's silly or that it's based upon premises that are wrong or that it's heading the county in the wrong direction. We can agree on all that, okay? But at the end of the day, what we have to look at are what are the environmental consequences of the plan that they put out there. And if they are truthful about the environmental consequences, then we can have a reasonable de debate. And that's the reason why the law requires that the master plan disclose the consequences of the plan. Okay, I'm going to ask you one last time. <laughs> I'm sorry. How do we, as a city and as a constituency, hold the county's feet to the fire to provide us with an honest, fact-based, truthful, plan other than real you know throw them out of office are there any legal remedies <laughs> it, it, this is this is one of those where lawyers say i'll get back to you on this oh, okay i just okay so would you <laughs> kindly I really, I really, would you kindly or nor i can come up with okay would, it, that would be a lovely um thing for you to talk about and research please based upon what you've presented tonight it's a great thank question you. So thank will. you Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. And um, I misspoke so, earlier when I said we would break. We have two written questions that came in, and as soon as we're done with those, we will take a break. Yes. So two questions written, uh, and I'll read them exactly as they're written. Uh, first, how will the facilities be enlarged if the change does not qualify as an expansion? So the difference between enlargement and expansion related to facilities. Well, and I, I, look, I read that question, and I think what the if I'm not missing the question, I think what the question is that the master plan contemplates some enlargement of facilities. Um, and why does that not trigger, quote, expansion in a vote? And the, I guess my answer would be the, there's no description with regard to, to, to facilities that say this building has to be X number of square feet. It just says... Sorry. I think we have a call for speaking closer into the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Jason, you need to talk into the microphone. Um, so, so, so there's nothing to say that, that the terminal building, for example, has to be X number of square feet. This conditional use permit just says terminal building. It doesn't say this many square feet. So just because you may be expanding the square footage of a building doesn't necessarily mean that it's an expansion for purposes of the voter approval requirement. And the second question was? The second question is, will flight paths be changed so planes will not fly over homes as they do now? <laughs> I believe that's going to be a substantial portion of our second presentation and discussion. So can we, can we hold that? I mean, the, the, the short answer is I don't know, um, but, uh, but it's certainly something we need to examine in detail. We'll put a note on the list Please, related to flight you. paths. Okay. okay. We're going to take a 10-minute break right now. We'll come back for part two. You'll have another opportunity for Q&A discussion, and uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Buddy, if you could start meandering back to your seats so we can get started. The second half of the meeting is the good half. It gets even more fun. So far, we did get one compliment on the meeting, and that is good cookies. Okay, is everyone about ready to get started? Uh, We're going to have another break. Yeah, I know, at but the this end. was to do yeah. with what you guys talked about last week. Okay. I don't. Okay, 30 seconds to sit down, and then I will turn it over to Peter Kirsch, who is going to introduce us to the next section of this meeting, which is about strategies for moving forward. I want you all to think bigger than the master plan and think bigger than the EIR. We really want to think about the future on this question. Thank you, everybody, so much for sitting down. And Mr. Kirsch, it's all yours. Thank you. This is, this is working, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. All right, that was the easy part. Um, so, so this, is, this begins the difficult part, which is that we've talked about what we can do, what's happened in the past, and we've had a lot, I thought, at least some interesting conversation about, about history and about intent and so on. And let's put that all to, to one side now for the moment and look forward. Because what we really want to do is get your advice, your feedback, your suggestions as to things that the city of Carlsbad can do with this airport, about this airport, to this airport, depending on what word you want to use, going forward. And so what, what I want to do is set the stage here a little bit and talk about some of the possible approaches, things, things the city might, might want to think about doing. One, one very easy possibility is this one. Um, and uh, those, can I get a show of hands of those who prefer this approach? Yeah, okay, we've got one in the back. You may leave now, sir. Um, there's also this approach, um, which, which no, no kidding aside, some people really get great comfort out of it. I, I would recommend that that, too, is not likely to be terrifically successful going forward, though it, though it is certainly a possibility. And the third approach that I'd recommend against is just sort of shaking hands 
with the airport and with the FAA and with the users and say, we'll just all get along fine. Um, none of these three approaches seem to me, from what I know about this community, to be the particularly best approaches going forward. So let's, so let's look, you know, a better idea. How, how should we look at the impacts of the airport and addressing the impact? And what I would suggest is a bit of a stair-step process. And the reason I say a stair-step process is that it's important for us to look at measures and their effectiveness, and almost as importantly, how easy or difficult it is to implement. Because we want to make sure that we are as effective as possible and that, frankly, we don't waste our effort. So the first thing we need to do before we look at any possible options is to really identify the problem. And that may sound sort of duh, right? But it actually is very difficult. And here's the reason that identifying the problem is difficult. Every community is different. And if, if I take a show of hands and, folk, and I ask folks, is the problem noise, yeah, I'll probably get a fair number of hands. And if I say, OK, now, with respect to noise, is the problem how loud the aircraft are or how many aircraft? Oh, well, some hands will go up in each way. OK, if I ask you, is it really the jet noise or is it the propeller noise that you, uh, you like more or less? And a different set of hands that go up. When I say, okay, is it the time of day and so on, we can ask many more questions. And, and the principle here is that the more carefully we are able to define the problem in this community, the more we're able to adopt approaches and strategies and tactics that are tailored to what you need here. And so this is not a minor question. It's a really important question. And with no disrespect to the city council intended, you folks are much better able to answer that than the city council, and so it's important to give that, that feedback to the council. The second question, the second step, if you will, in the process is to identify measures that the city itself can implement. That is, let's ask the question. We know what the problem is. Going back, I think some folks were asking earlier about purpose and need for the expansion. Okay, let's look at the problem in a purpose and need sort of way. And what can the city do within the city's authorities, particularly with respect to land use, because that's something the city has the most authority over, and what are the actions the city can take, and how effective are those actions going to be? And let's examine each of those actions and ask the same question. Is that particular measure, is that particular action likely to be effective? Now, I will tell you, and I'm sort of telegraphing at the very end here, you're not going to find one action that's going to solve your problems. I hate to tell you that. But it's, not, it's, going to be, it's going to be a bushel. And each one will have different levels of effectiveness. And so what we need to do, what I'd like to have come out of t tonight's session is a sense of what's in that bushel. Okay, what sort of activities, what sort of actions can the city take that would address the impacts of the airport within the authority the city has? And let's add that into the basket of, of, of measures. So the third step then would be to in identify and implement non-restrictive or voluntary measures having to do with the operation of aircraft. Because these are things the county can do. Not the FAA, but the county can do. It requires the county's cooperation. But we look at what things could the county do within their authority voluntarily to get operations to change, and we can talk about a lot of those in a moment, that would have some effect. Again, let's not, let's not assume that any one of those measures will be the will be the silver bullet that will solve all the problems, but let's look at what the effects would be and what impacts we can reduce through county action. And then the final step, which is the step that I hope we don't have to get to, is to look at restrictive measures, that is those things that re require the FAA's approval. Now the reason I say we, I hope we don't get there is, as may be obvious, it gets harder as you go up this step. Okay. Step four is going to be much more difficult, much more time consuming, much more expensive, much riskier, less likely to succeed than the things at step one. And so when we put together the basket, we should be looking at the easiest things first, see with how, how effective they will be. Let's assess how effective they're going to be. And then let's go to the step two, step three, step four. So when we identify, when we start looking at those four steps and, and identify the local problem, it's really important that you be able to convey to the city council with a fair amount of precision what is the problem? Why is it that there are so many people uh, in, in, the, in a room on a, on a nice Thursday evening, Tuesday evening? 
Tuesday evening, say evening. Um, uh, um, on a pleasant Tuesday evening, sitting here listening to a lawyer talk, well, what, you know, what is the specific problem? And the more precise you are, and, and Celia's going to be taking good notes, right? The more precise you are, the more able we're able to say, okay, here are the measures that are going to address that precise problem. So let's, let's take one example. Noise. Let's just see a show of hands. How many people have some concern about noise about the airport? Okay. Maybe I'll do it the other way. Who doesn't care about the noise in the airport? And in which case, why are you here? And I'm going to come back to all of you in a moment. This map is one way of depicting noise from the airport. It happens to be the standard way in which the FAA depicts noise, which is a contour showing average day-night noise levels known as CNEL. And that contour shows, if I'm the FAA, there is no noise problem at this airport, full stop. Okay, go home. Bye. No problem. How many of you believe that? Well, the reason is they didn't ask the right question. Because the FAA had a standard that says, this is how we measure noise, and this is how we assess whether there's a noise problem, and we've decided there's not a noise problem, based upon the average day-night noise level of aircraft coming off this airport. What this didn't ask is, what about the difference between day and night? What about the difference between props and jets? What about the difference in altitude between these kind of aircraft and that kind of aircraft? What about flight tracks and so on? These are not questions that are asked in this, in this analysis. And so it's important that we ask very specifically, what is it about noise that we, can, that we care about? For example, one of the questions we may ask is, do we care about what's known as en route noise? This is a very hot topic around the country today, and that is, the noise generated by aircraft that are simply flying over the city on the way to somewhere else. Maybe they're on their way to San Diego International, maybe they're on their way to John Wayne, or, or all the way up to Seattle, who knows. Is it, the, is it the aircraft that are simply flying over the city? The reason I ask, the reason it's important to understand that, is the tools to address en route noise are fundamentally different than the tools you would use for arrival and departure noise. And so let's, you know, we need to spend a little time thinking about, is it the aircraft that are arriving and departing from Carlsbad Airport that are causing the problem, the noise problem, or is it the aircraft on their way to somewhere else? Because, because again, how we address that will be a function of where the noise is coming from. Another category of noise is what I would call uh, airport-related noise. And that has to do with things like aircraft running up their engines on the ground. It has to do with the the noise just from normal airport operations on the ground. And if that is a greater concern, if that is a concern, how we address that is very different and, by the way, much easier than addressing en route noise or arrival and departure noise. And so this is something that we as your, as the count, as a city's lawyers, can't give you a lot of advice on because, it's, because you live here and we don't. It's, it, we, we need to understand with precision. And so when, we, when, when I ask people to come up with the Q&A later this evening, it would be very helpful, and, and I don't mean to be critical of anybody, but since nobody's spoken, I can be critical of everybody, I guess. Please tell us when you say the noise is a problem, please tell us what you mean. What kind of noise, and when's it a problem, and how's it a problem? And I've talked to a couple of folks during the break who were, who were commenting on the fact that, in fact, propeller planes sometimes are more irritating than jets. Well, gee, I thought we were trying to keep from what I understood, larger jets out of this airport. But propellers are more irritating. That's interesting. And that may affect the strategies going forward. So that's, that has just to do with noise. Let's talk about land use around the airport and how we address that. It's important to distinguish where around the airport we're concerned about land use. You know, on, this, on this slide, the red areas are the areas where I would suspect we're most concerned because those are the ends of the runways in this sort of generic diagram whereas the green areas are areas that might have some effect, might be affected by the airport, but somewhat less so. And so if we're talking about land use and about, if you will, sort of uh, off-airport land uses, it's important to be very specific. Are we concerned about land uses off the two ends of the runway? Are we concerned, one gentleman talked to me during the break about his concern about what was called pattern flying, um, the small aircraft that fly in circles. Well, that's not the ends of the runways. We're much more concerned then about the areas around the airport. And so being precise about understanding what land uses are affected is really important. So I've, 
I've sort of laid out here, if you will, the importance of our speaking to each other precisely in understanding the problem so that those who are good at devising solutions know what solutions we're looking for. So let me talk about four categories of options to consider and make a couple comments here before I get to that. First of all, this is not intended to be an exhaustive list of options. It's really intended to generate conversation. And so it's not a fair comment to come up and tell me I've missed something. Uh, because in fact, I know we've missed something. But what I'm trying to do in the next couple slides is give you illustrations of the sorts of things that airports have done in the past and what airports have found to be successful in various different environments. When you look at these options, it's really important to think about how aggressive the city wants to be. And some of you may have seen this slide before in a city council <coughs> session a couple months ago where we said the city council, not, not the lawyers, but the city council has to decide how aggressive it wants to be. One gentleman came up to me during the break and said, you know what you got to do? you got to make law. And I said, fine. I'm very happy to make law. We're very happy to push the envelope. If I tell you there's a 0.1% chance of something happening, I'm willing to pursue that if that's the direction the city council gives us. And so what's really important is that you convey to the city council how aggressive you want them to be. Bad news, it's more expensive to be more aggressive. It's more risky to be more aggressive. But that's, that's something that's important to communicate to the city council. So let me oversimplify a little bit before I get to a couple of examples and talk about experience elsewhere, sort of what other airports have done. And we could spend an entire evening going over each of these airports. Um, these are all airports where, where we've worked in one capacity or another. But I think a couple of themes come out of here, that there are solutions that have proven to be very successful in one community and very unsuccessful in another. So let's take San Francisco. San Francisco has a roundtable program, which is an advisory group made up of all the stakeholders around SFO. And they meet constantly, don't they, Sarah? Yeah. I mean, way too much. I mean, sorry. They meet a lot. Um, and and in, in the context of San Francisco, this has been enormously successful until recently, and we can talk about that in a moment, at, at generating a degree of community buy-in to understanding the impacts. We can take an example of Sun Valley, Idaho, which ran into a real problem of distrust of the airport, and they created a joint powers agency, so both the city and the county in that case jointly owned the airport, so they each watch out for each other. And that ended up being really quite successful. Does that work in other areas? Maybe, maybe not. In the case of Minneapolis, also on this map, they decided Minneapolis environment, as you may know, is slightly different than Carlsbad. <coughs> and sound insulation turned out to be very, very effective because newsflash, they keep their windows closed in the winter. And so the city, the airport, engaged in an aggressive program to sound insulate homes, which was tremendously successful. Now, would that be successful in Carlsbad? I kind of doubt it. But, it's a, but again, in Minneapolis, it worked very well. <clears throat> in the case of Naples, Florida, they were the one airport that has adopt, adopted a restriction on aircraft since 1990. And they restricted the noisiest aircraft in the fleet beginning in, in uh, 1999. And all of those aircraft have since, since been banned from the United States. So they spent about five, seven years working on a restriction that had an effect for about five or seven years. Very, very successful for the community. They were very appreciative of the effort the airport went to and the expense and so on. But it was only something that lasted for a couple of years till those noisiest aircraft were, were phased out of the fleet. So I could keep going through other examples. I'm happy to, happy to talk about those, about those. But I also want to talk about a couple of unhelpful examples as, again, an illustration of the fact that a solution that works in one city doesn't work in another. So Denver had a huge problem with noise and impacts on nearby residents at Stapleton Airport. How many of you have know of Stapleton Airport? OK, you're showing your age. Don't do that. Um, and they decided, look, here's the problem. This airport is so constrained by residential growth on every side, we're going to close it and move it. Well, that was a great solution for Denver. And by the way, I think it was, in fact, a very good solution. But it wouldn't have worked at another airport. And any of you who followed the, the efforts to move or relocate uh, San Diego International know that's not likely to be a particularly successful uh, tactic in, in, in San Diego County. 
Um, there are other airports. I, 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 one of the um, dots here is at uh, East Hampton, New York, which spent an extraordinary amount of time and effort to restrict helicopters, uh, spent a lot of money on litigation. Ultimately, they lost. Um, and not quite clear whether it was successful, whether all of the effort, notwithstanding the fact they lost, was even worth the effort and a lot of community debate about whether or not they pursued the right path. So I use these as examples to illustrate the fact that just because something works in one community does not necessarily mean it's going to work here in Carlsbad, and that's really your role, is to ed educate the city council. So let's go through some options. And again, this is going to be on the city website later, so you don't have to copy this down, but I'm throwing these out relatively quickly here just so you can see the kinds of things that I'd like you to begin think of, thinking about as you come up with your Q's and A's. So one is to work with San Diego on a couple of different things. One is a land use compatibility program, that is measures to make sure that the land uses around the airport are compatible with the airport and vice versa in a more aggressive way than has been done in the past. Don't know if that would be either successful or useful, but it's certainly something worth considering. Another is to ask San Diego County to pursue a restriction on aircraft operations, to be the first in the nation to succeed. Not something I think is terribly likely, uh, and very, very aggressive on that aggressiveness scale, but at least something possible. Another, again, a program that I suspect is not terribly popular in, in Carlsbad would be to insulate more homes so that more of you can keep your windows closed during the, uh, during the nice time of year. Uh, 363 days of the year. Um, you know, again, not something that's terribly likely to be successful here, but, it, but worth putting on the table and, and talking about. Um, another is to work with San Diego County and the FAA to try to restrict certain kinds of operations. And by restrict, I want to get very specific here, sort of like noise. What do we mean by restrict? Do we mean ban? Do we mean Restrict at nighttime? Do we mean voluntarily use certain departure procedures and arrival procedures to minimize noise? And you know, are we concerned about jets? Are we concerned about the noisiest aircraft? Are we concerned about nighttime? These are all questions that we really have to ask in the community to make sure that what we're looking at is, is appropriate. So these are options that regulate how the airport operates. Another set of options is to look at flight tracks and flight procedures, <clears throat> something that is somewhat more difficult than restricting aircraft operations because it requires much more involvement of the FAA. But one option is to seek to have San Diego County and the FAA cooperate in establishing what are known as noise abatement departure uh, uh, flight tracks, that is flight tracks that are designed to make sure that the greatest noise impact is felt in those parts of the city that are most compatible with noise, that is industrial and commercial areas and not, uh, not residential areas, something that a number of airports do and really do quite successfully, particularly if the land uses around the airport can accommodate that. One of the questions in this community, just given the geography, is whether it's possible to have flight tracks that will reduce the impacts on residences. If you look at the map, right in the immediate vicinity of the airport, there's a lot of commercial industrial property. But everybody knows the aircraft don't just go straight out and straight in, they turn. And when they turn, that's when we get into residential, residential property. So the question is, are there flight tracks that could be adopted that would significantly reduce the impacts? A good example of that, anybody who's flown out of John Wayne Airport knows that there are some squirrely flight tracks for uh, air, commercial aircraft leaving that airport that are designed to reduce the impacts in, um, uh, in, in the areas around John Wayne Airport and have been really quite successful. I won't say 100% successful, but they've been quite successful and very aggressive in reducing impacts there. Arrival and departure procedures at some airports are very effective in reducing impacts. These aren't flight tracks, but the procedures. That is how quickly the, the aircraft come down or go up. And there are a number of different procedures that are available for pilots to use that can be either imposed mandatorily or voluntarily on aircraft to make sure that the impacts are where you want the impacts to be. So let's go to a third category, which is off-airport measures, ones that I suspect in this community are important but not likely to be quite as successful as in, as in other communities. One is to ensure that the land use around the airport is compatible with the airport. And the reason I say that this is not likely to be terribly successful is you already have largely commercial and industrial property right near the airport. 
And so zoning or changing the land uses around the airport, this is not a situation like you might have at Midway in Chicago or the old Stapleton in Denver or Boston where you have residential areas right off the end of the runway. But again, something worth, worth exploring if it turns out there are particular uh, neighborhoods or particular areas that are, uh, that are receiving excessive impacts. <clears throat> Another off-airport measure which doesn't address noise at all, at least aircraft noise, is to look at the traffic impacts and see what are the best ways to mitigate the traffic impacts and, and to work with San Diego County to force the, the, to force the county or convince the county to spend time and, and, and effort on that. Finally, <clears throat> Non-regulatory measures, that is, things that aren't mandatory in the law, can be very effective in certain communities. I mentioned the idea of a formal roundtable or communications tool, which in many communities <coughs> is very effective. Whether that would work in, in, in Carlsbad and San Diego County is, is, is something I'd like, like to hear from people on, but it certainly has been very effective. <coughs> Joint governance options are something we've certainly heard people talk to the city council about. These go everything from an MOU or a memorandum of understanding with the county as to how they will govern the airport to a formal joint powers agreement in which the airport is jointly governed by, say, the city of Carlsbad and the county or a bunch of cities in the county. And those tools have been used really very effectively uh, in California and elsewhere around the country. So I think if there's one piece I want to leave you with here is that Maybe this is a news flash, but I hope it isn't, that there's no universal strategy. That is, there's no one strategy that's going to work in every community. And in this community in particular, there's not one particular measure that I think is going to solve the problems. It really will require a package. So what we would like to hear from you about in the next Q&A session is, OK, of the things you've heard about, first of all, what have I forgotten? Because I'm sure I've forgotten something. And which of the kinds of measures do you think are ones we should pursue? But as you begin to come up and give us suggestions, think about, think about a number of different issues. You know, which options are worth pursuing? Um, which ones are most important? Are we, do, we, do we want to go for gold? Do we want to go for the most difficult, most aggressive, most expensive, riskiest option first? I would recommend against it, but that's the city council's call. Or do we want to take an incremental approach where we try something, see how good that is, try something else, see how good that is, and so on. And so it's that kind of feedback I think that's going to be very important for the city council in deciding what is the next set of steps they take in, uh, in dealing with the airport and dealing with the county. So that was very fast. And I only sort of apologize for doing this so fast because I know everybody wants to get out of here eventually. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jason and Celia for, for sort of organizing the, the Q&A. OK, so once again, um, please line up at the podium. But you know what? Let's just take a second. Can we give Peter and Sarah a round of applause? <laughs> I feel so fortunate that they're here to help us guide us through this path. So line up at the podium. Again, if you have um, questions that you would like to submit on speaker slips, try passing those to the outside aisles. And we will. Um, circulate and pick those up. And with that, Peter, they're, are, they're all yours. Please. All right. Yeah, some of the problems that you didn't list is um, the $200 cab fare up and back from Carlsbad to San Diego Airport, which if I flew out of Carlsbad, I wouldn't have that because I'm five minutes from the airport. The other problem is the two hours that I lose having to go all the way to San Diego and back, when I'm five minutes from the airport, the parking here is $3 a day. Down there, it's over $30 a day. Um, Carlsbad is a hub of some of the largest companies in San Diego. We have several restaurant companies. We have all kinds of biotech. We have every golf company known to man. Uh, there are a lot of companies here that used to fly out of that airport on United, which was me, which I flew out probably twice a week out of that airport. Now I have to go all the way to San Diego. So my company is incurring all kinds of expenses for me to have to go to San Diego. I'm representing the thousands of people that flew out of there 
and all these businesses that would benefit from it being there and my own personal convenience. And I hear these people saying the community doesn't want it, the citizens don't want it. I'm a citizen of Carlsbad. I want it. And it, there isn't noise, like you said. Those prop jets that we used to fly on United, <laughs> those were noisy. The little RJs 700 that we'd fly in here, I fly those all the time. They don't make any noise. It's like so quiet. So I agree with you. What is, what is the problem? I would like people to, to do it. I think what they're just hearing is, oh, if we have more planes in here, my property values are going down. Um, sometimes I think, you know, why, you know, I bought my property next to the airport and then the next day I start complaining that there's an airport next to me. It's like when you bought the house next to the airport, you forfeited your ability to complain because you knew what you're getting into. So I, I, I question that. Um, the city of Carlsbad would benefit immensely from having more of the planes come in. All the people, all the businesses and communities, all the people that live and work in Carlsbad would benefit from it, which I don't think is being considered. And I know a lot of people behind me don't like what I'm saying, <laughs> but I needed to voice it because most people that have my opinion aren't even here. They're working super long hours or late or they're flying somewhere, taking care of business. And that business is what makes Carlsbad an awesome place to live. It's a very affluent place. We, we attract a lot of wonderful companies which employ a lot of the people in Carlsbad that allow us to live in this paradise. Um, so I just wanted to voice that opinion. So, you, so at least someone says it, right? So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, good evening. My name is Paul Hook, and I am the president and CEO of California Pacific Airlines. Uh, that is not CalJet. It is California Pacific Airlines. Uh, we have been trying for quite some while to come in here, and the aircraft that we intend to use is the Embraer 170 and the Embraer 145. Um, I heard people saying there's lots of black stuff that comes down over their houses, their... Uh, gardens, everything else, well, I would certainly encourage everybody to look at the data specification sheets for these two aircraft, because it states and has been proven that these aircraft, they are jets, but they have zero smoke emissions. I'll repeat that, zero smoke emissions. So if you look those aircraft up and look at the data sheets, it will prove just what I'm telling you. The other thing that people do not seem to understand is that the jet engine has become quieter and quieter and quieter. Initially, the initial jet aircraft were stage one, which were extremely noisy, black smoke everywhere, and you heard it crackling down the runway on takeoff, like the old Boeing 707 that I first started flying all those years ago. Now we have what's called stage two came along, stage three came along, and that was all predicated on noise, reducing the noise factor. But now we have stage four. Stage four not only concentrates on reducing the noise further, but it also concentrates on reducing emissions. And that is a point that people t seem to miss. Stage four not only addresses noise, but it addresses emissions. The aircraft that we want to bring here are all stage four aircraft. And in case you wonder, yes, Carlsbad has in Palomar Airport already has flight paths that can be used to reduce noise. Yes, they are voluntary, but if they follow these noise abatement procedures, one of them is if you're taking off going to the west, you climb ahead to at least 2,000 feet and you go over the sea before you make any turn. So I think that Palomar is doing everything that it can 
to make people's lives around the airport acceptable. We talk about quality of life. I think the gentleman that was just ahead of me uh, sort of summed that up. You know, people here need to be able to travel with ease instead of having to go to Lindbergh, instead of having to trouble, uh, travel up to LAX. They can get out of here in about 45 minutes instead of like a three hours, because if you go to Lindbergh, you've got to be there two hours before your flight. And according to Google Maps, you can get from Palomar down to San Diego in 45 minutes. If you're doing 90 miles an hour, I think you can. Otherwise, I really am very skeptical on that. So with that, all I can say is that I hope that people will understand that when the other airlines were here, there were problems, yes. And one of them was actually reliability. The problem was they didn't have their own certificate. They were relying on another air, 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 uh, airline to supply that. We have our own certificate. We have our own airplanes. And we will make sure that there are at least three airplanes here so that if one breaks, we can put another on the line and nobody is inconvenienced. I really thank everybody for listening to me tonight. And I really hope that we will see you at Palomar Airport flying to Las Vegas, Phoenix, San Diego, all the good places that you really want to go. Thank you very much. OK, if I may, I'm going to jump in really quickly with uh, one of the questions that we received on the comment card. It follows uh, somewhat along the lines of uh, that last comment. And um, I'll read this one. It says, my view of the problem is that we lost regular commercial flights. What can we do to encourage commercial providers to serve our airport? By the way, I only live about two miles from the airport and hear planes all the time. Uh, it's a three-part question, but I'll just say the most bothersome noise is helicopters after about 11 p.m. And uh, final comment, I do not want the city to aggressively fight the county plan, just work with them. So uh, there was one question about uh, encouraging commercial providers to serve our airport, and any uh, advice you can give on that would be helpful. Yeah, this, this is an issue that a lot of communities are facing, and frankly, I think the, the previous speak, two speakers uh, um, alluded to it, and that is that as traffic gets worse and people's demands in air travel get more demanding, uh, smaller airports are becoming very attractive for commercial service. Uh, we're representing a company that's building a second commercial service airport outside Seattle. Uh, and we, we're certainly seeing this happening in the Bay Area. We're seeing this happen in, in, uh, in, in a number of other cities in, in Texas and so on. Um, the market is enormously competitive. Uh, and uh, the, the airlines are, are no, no exception to that. And so attracting commercial service is something that requires a business community that is receptive to that and a public that's receptive to that. And, and what, one of the real questions is can you uh, operate as, as, as a commercial enterprise and make money notwithstanding a, a level of community concern about noise? And the answer usually is yes. The more responsible operators are able to to work with the community and develop both uh, use of particular kinds of aircraft, uh, particular flight tracks that are able to reduce the impacts to a level that the community finds to be to be to be quite acceptable, particularly in light of the of the benefits that provided by commercial service. But it's a it's a long it's a long slog. It's not easy. It's not easy for the airline, as I'm sure the previous gentleman will test. It's not easy for the airport operator. It's not easy for the community. But it has to really be a cooperative effort. My name is Matt Schachter, and I live in Aviara, which is about uh, a mile and a half from the uh, ends of the runway, southwest from here. A um, couple of comments, first of all, on previous speakers. Um, the fact that there's no smoke coming out of these jets, there's something come out of the, coming out of those engines, because that's how engines work. So if it's not smoke, it's not something you'd want to stand behind and breathe, that's for certain. My other comment is as far as convenience to, tw to travel from here. I live here 365 days a year. I might fly a few times a year, but I live here every day and every night, and I look at this as the 
city that I live in and I want to continue to live in. So to me, that's utmost, what, what the conditions are in this city day and night, 365 days a year. Now, a little history. I moved here in 04, and I knew there was an airport in the area, and the real estate agent said, oh, don't worry about it because the rules are, and she didn't really tell me who made the rules or whether they were enforced, but the planes come in from the east, they land, they take off, they go out over the ocean, and then they bank and go north or south or straight ahead. And that was pretty much true for about 10 years. Something has changed in the way the aircraft work here. And especially something has changed in, in the way that the prop planes can circle around and circle around and apparently don't have any real regulation as to how many times they can go around, how high or how low they can fly. Now, I've called and I've complained I don't bother anymore, but I was told that there's something called web track where you can get on your computer and look and see who's flying and, and what their tail numbers were very often. Well, web track doesn't work if it's below 500 feet. And it's the planes below 500 feet that make most of the noise and come over the residential areas the most frequently. So complaining doesn't do anything, and I certainly don't have the eyesight to see the tail numbers on these planes even 500 or 200 feet, much less higher. There are times when I'm in my backyard or I'm out in front, and the planes coming over make me think of watching the movie Dunkirk, when the Luftwaffe was strafing the British on the beach. They're low, they're loud, and sometimes they're really frequent. And that's my big concern. I really don't hear the jets except in the distance. And I knew there was an airport when I moved here. And I knew there were commercial operations. And they came in from the east, and they pretty much went to the west. It's the little guys, the single engine, and the, the dual engine prop planes, and occasionally a smaller jet. And they seem to go wherever they want. And as far as having regulations that are voluntary, I don't buy it. We don't have voluntary regulations for speed limits on the freeway. There are speed limits, tolerance, but if you're going 90 miles an hour, the CHP is going to get you, and it's going to cost you, and maybe you're going to go to jail, and maybe you're going to lose your license. That doesn't happen with the way that people fly around in Carlsbad. I've said my piece. Um. When uh, City Attorney Celia Brewer um, mentioned the topic of this second portion, she said strategies for the future. And I think that's really important to focus on because uh, when we hearken back to decisions that were made, even by a community vote in 1970, there were like 14,000 people living here. It was the airport was surrounded by coyotes and sagebrush. They could never have envisioned what Carlsbad is today. They really couldn't have. They, it, it would have been impossible. It would, I, I was here, and we couldn't have envisioned what Carlsbad would become. So I want us to, to not lose perspective of we're only looking dimly at what will be ahead. Other people have already commented on increased technology of airplanes and quieter planes, just like we have quieter cars. And so the technology is going to change. And we have to remember that the impression that you're receiving may not be always accurate, because within a five-mile radius of Palomar McClellan Airport are about 200,000 people living, and they're only less than 100 people in this room. So you might be getting a little bit of a narrow perspective on the, excuse me, the whole community's view of Palomar Airport. So I, I'm really, I, I love Carlsbad. And one of our strengths, one of our greatest strengths is collaborability. Is that a word? Collaborability. We collaborate. We work together. We listen to one another. So when you showed the strategies of how aggressive, I would hope that we can work collaboratively with the business community, with the gentleman who's building an airline, with the gentleman who, who is concerned about 
the environmental impact of a million trips to San Diego, it, it impacts all of us. So I hope we won't be aggressive and we won't see the county as our enemy or our city council as our enemy, but we will work as a team to come up with solutions based on the reality of the future we are not maybe going to be living in. And if Carlsbad is this cutting edge today, why can't we be cutting edge looking for the future? That's the hope I'm having of the impression of us tonight. Thank you. Thank you guys for doing this tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I've got a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Um, First of all, um, Mr. Hooker, uh, Hook, thank you, I'm sorry. Mr. Hook um, with Cal Pacific, right? California Pacific. California Pacific, okay. The, the good news about that is, as I understand it, you can fly your airline out of Palomar as that airport is today, is that correct? Correct. Problem solved, to some degree. So. Um, I, I would encourage people to understand that I don't think there's a lot of people who want to close the airport down. I think there's a lot of people who don't want to see expansion that's going to expand the issues at the airport. And if Lori Boone is correct and technology keeps moving forward, um, we may not really need an expanded airport. So. Uh, the purpose of this expansion is something that I'd really like to see the city council really explore. It um, right now m may not make sense. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, and it's really more of a question, is we've heard for years from our city that they don't have anything that they can do about the airport. We've heard for years from the Palomar Airport Advisory Committee regarding noise abatement and flight tracks that that can't be done, that that can't be changed. So I'd like to get an idea from you folks as to how aggressive we'd really have to be as a city to get some changes on those kinds of things. And as a matter of fact, if you can apply some of the example, excuse me, some of the examples you gave us to your aggressiveness continuum, that would help us, I think, to better understand what we're up against. Thank you. So, so let, me, let me first address the idea that it's impossible to, to deal with to address flight tracks. That's just wrong. Thank it's you. It's not true. Um, now, it's not easy, okay? It's not something you can wake up tomorrow and have done. Um, and the communities that have been successful at, at uh, getting the flight tracks they need uh, are ones who've been who have been working at it steadily for a period of years. Now, what does that require? First of all, it requires a degree of cooperation between the community and the airport owner. I don't know whether that cooperation exists today, but that should certainly be a first foundation. The second is to get the airport owner, the county, to be willing to work with the FAA which again is not impossible, it exists all over the country. Uh, I don't know how much San Diego County is willing to work with the FAA. Um, and the third, which is a little bit fuzzier, is the getting the county to be willing to use its considerable jawbone power with the users of the airport. Um, and I can give you lots of examples around the country where communities and airports and the FAA and users have gotten together and have adopted flight tracks that are, that are safe, useful for the, for the users, for the pilots and the, and the aircraft owners, and that substantially reduce noise. So that's not impossible. But it's not something that happens overnight. It's a period, it's a, it's a, it's a, it requires a process of negotiation. Uh, and my gut reaction from looking at the geography here is that this is not a community where they're, do a double negative here, this is not a community with no solutions. There are some airports that have such a dense population right in immediate vicinity that somebody is going to be hurt. But given the geography here, and I think one of the earlier gentlemen spoke about the, the, the value of aircraft flying directly west out of the airport rather than turning or coming in directly from the east, there are solutions here. And, and I think it's, it's really a matter of committing the city 
and, and convincing the county that it's in their best interest to work with the city to develop flight tracks. And, and the, the real challenge here, frankly, is not convincing the city or convincing the FAA, but it's convincing the community that there are indeed solutions. And that this isn't me versus you, this, this is not Vista versus, versus um, uh, Carlsbad, but that in fact there are solutions. And that requires a fair amount of technical work, and I almost spilled my coffee all over <laughs> Um, but, but I think, I, mean, I, I, I guess if there's a, a short answer to that is I would not lose hope because we've worked with a lot of communities that have been very successful at that. Good. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name's Bob Carter. I just had a few thoughts um, uh, I wanted to go over. One was the issue of I bought my house here when there was an airport and therefore I don't have a complaint. Uh, it was a general aviation airport, and as a pilot, I know what a general aviation airport used to be, and all of a sudden, the corporate jets came along and kind of expanded that because they were small planes with jet engines, and I'm not sure the FAA totally changed their definition, but uh, these planes do put out a lot of smoke. Uh, whether it's cancerous or not, I'm not in a position to say. Uh, I was raised next to the LA airport, and the runway went to Sepulveda Boulevard with it, and they put in a tunnel. The original runway was one building, the Mike Lyman's restaurant on top. Okay, you might remember it, right? And we were sold on a new airport, and all of a sudden we got the LA airport, and the runways went to 10,000 feet, and I was living two blocks away from that. And I could go out every morning and rub my car and pick up the soot on my car. I was a teenager who loved to keep a clean car. And you could hardly breathe in the area. I know the airplanes engines are much better today. But then the runways went to 12,000 feet. 747s came along. It was unbelievable. The reversers on the landings were just as bad as the takeoff noise. And there were times they were landing on runways 25 left and right every 30 seconds. Then they expanded it to northern runways. I know this is boring. And then they bought out the, the buildings on the west side of the runway. The city did, or the county. Then they bought out Westchester. Then they bought out 30% of Englewood. It just never stops. And I'm concerned about the issue where it was said earlier that there were no, u no new uses of this airport. Well, to go from a B2 to a D3 is a new use. That opens up a whole uh, different class of airplanes. Can anybody tell me right now uh, the Embry Air 170, uh, 130 is it? 170? There's a smaller Embry Air that you could take off out of Carlsbad. The problem is it doesn't make as much money as the 170. It needs a 500 feet more, I read the argument, 500 feet more runway. And guess what? That's exactly what this is recommending just enough to get that plane off the ground. It, we have new engines on these airplanes. I just flew to Hawaii on a 737. Now think about that. That was originally a short all airplane. New modern airplanes have bigger engines. They need less runway. Okay. That was unheard of to fly to Europe with a twin engine airplane. The new 777 has 115,000 pounds of thrust. The original 747 had 35,000 pounds. So you could use the same runway that we have today with a more modern, more powerful airplane and not need an extension, not need a new runway. All you have to do is check out the stats on the new airplanes. So I think that's a solution. Uh, my concern is car traffic. The more successful the uh, airport is, the more traffic is going to be around the corner of El Camino Real and Palomar Airport Road, which is already, I'd call a disaster at certain times of the day. And if it's really successful, you're going to be multi-story parking facilities. And I think it gets down to a quality of life issues for, for the people of Carlsbad. I have never had any trouble driving to San Diego. Yeah, sometimes if it's in the middle of the traffic, it's a pain, but I try to plan it so it's not that time. Back to the LA airport issue, and then I'll be done. Uh, it was bad enough that living in El Segundo, you had to put up with the noise of the airport on takeoff and landing, but the people and the money in Palos Verdes and Beverly Hills didn't like the planes circling around to go east 
to go over their cities. So they lobbied and had the planes go out over the Pacific Ocean, go out 10 miles, make a 180 degree turn, and come back over El Segundo again. So the people in PV and the people in Beverly Hills didn't have to listen to the noise. So they got, a, they got the double whammy, right? So I, 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 I'm not sure I can be overly objective about this, but one of the things you can do is keep the runway shorter, the way it is now, save, I don't know what, I've heard $200 million, I don't know what all this costs, buy new, more powerful airplanes, use the runway you already have, and see if this thing flies. We haven't even seen at this airport whether a viable origin airport operation can make money. This elite company, they, they I don't know, they might be coming back, but uh, we haven't even seen that this would operate, and I think to spend all that money is kind of, uh, you know, it'd be one thing if you, if you had a good success story. You had 85% load factors to San Jose and, and Tucson, and you did that for a year or two, and an airport was, a, uh, an airline was a viable operation. But to spend that kind of money, we don't even know it, uh, that it's going to work. Okay? So in the meantime, I'll go down to uh, Lindbergh Field. It is a pain at times but it's a pain I'm willing to put up with or the lack of noise in the cleaner air. That's all I gotta say, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna take another opportunity here to jump in with a question that we received uh, on one of our comment cards, and I'm gonna invite the city's environmental programs manager, James Wood, up to help answer it. Um, the question is, has the city determined whether there has been groundwater contamination from the existing airport operation? And how will you mitigate the groundwater contamination issues from further disturbing the landfill? What is the city doing to ensure that adequate testing is being done to protect Carlsbad's aquifer and groundwater quality? James. Thanks, Jason. Um, thanks for the question. Um, the city of Carlsbad does not regulate the landfill um, at the airport. That's done by the Department of um, the Department of Resources, Recycling, and Recovery, and that is enforced through the LEA, which is the, um, the local enforcement agency. So that actually the landfill itself is regulated and, and managed and oversight, has oversight from those agencies. Outside of that, the city of Carlsbad does have a water quality improvement plan that is on our website, so please go there and if you want to take a look at it or talk to me afterwards, I'm happy to go into more detail on any of this. But we do have a water quality improvement plan which includes a monitoring plan it's approved by the regional board, the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, and that lays out all the monitoring that we do. We have, in this area where the airport is, we have six major outfalls that are monitored, uh, four in the Encinas, Encina Waste, and, and sorry, in the Encina watershed, and two in the Aguajedeonda watershed. So those are mo uh, monitored as part of this plan. And then we also do um, receiving water monitoring through the um, through our, our, in our lagoon, uh, Agua Hedienda Lagoon that's done, and that'll be done this summer as well, and that's looking at um, a whole host of pollutants um, as required by our permit. So all of that information is on our website. It's on Project Clean Water if you'd like more information, but that's what the city's doing, uh, monitoring groundwater and the water that's going into our receiving waters, our creeks and lagoons. Thank you. Well, can I ask a follow-up question since you're here? Um, what about Title 40 and the disturbance of a, a closed landfill? All of that. No, it's not under your thing, but I mean, what's your opinion on that? Right. Well, it, that would be completely under LEA to evaluate and to monitor. We, as a city, that's outside of our jurisdiction. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to go there, but I will say that the county does have the same, they have the same requirement, permit requirements that we as a city of Carlsbad have, the, the county of San Diego. It's the same permit, they're held to the same standards, so they should be monitoring and doing all of that according to the same plan that we as a city is doing. So that would be at the county level, though, to answer that question and That's to manage that. Sure. Thank you. So uh, I just wanted to, I, a couple of things, I'm, I'm going to get designing real quick, but after, before that, I just want to say that, you know, Sandag's putting in a lot of money for in infrastructure for tracking down to San Diego. That's going to increase trains so we can just drive over there, get on a train, and ride, ride the train every day. It's a beautiful thing. I don't sit in traffic, and, and once that double track gets in, it's going to be even better because they're going to have more 
you know, regular times, and I think that that's a, one of the solutions. The other thing that Sandag is looking at is putting an aerial tram in from, from the station to the airport. So once again, you get off the train, you get on the aerial tram, boom, you're at the airport. So you don't need to pay $200 for a cab, you know, or you don't need to drive your car and pay for parking. So those are a couple solutions that are coming down the pike, and I hope that, you know, we can go there. The next thing is basically the noise thing that you showed. I know there's different studies and different studies that they use. One is like, like the single-use noise, and then the other one is, you know, the one that they're using for their modeling. I think the single-use noise is, is a much better, um, and I don't know how we can force the hand to, to use that, but, uh, you know, that's something I've researched and looked at. The last thing is zoning. What can the city do to maybe slow down the outside? You, we can't touch the property, but we can touch the zoning around that. I know you said that's a uphill, but I think on your, on your step ladder, that was like number two step, so it wasn't high. So um, if you could elaborate on that, that'd be awesome. There, there, there are two different potential solutions or potential approaches to zoning around the airport. One is to prevent the encroachment of incompatible land use. And the city's in very good shape there. That is, you don't have any residential land use right near the airport. So there's not a real threat that there'll be new homes built right near the airport. So that's one approach, though it's certainly worth looking <coughs> at areas further out from the airport to make sure that your zoning is, co is consistent with the noise levels. But the second is the one that you addressed, which is that <coughs> off-airport commercial and industrial uses can have a significant impact on a community. And the question is, do you want to encourage those or discourage those? And you do have authority through your zoning laws to encourage or discourage. So if you don't want to have, for example, a, a large number of parking lots uh, around your airport the way, say, LAX does, zoning can be very effective for that. And rent a cars. Or rent a cars and things like that, that. exactly. And so and it, it's, it, it's a legitimate question as to whether or not you want to encourage or discourage those, because of course those both have impacts and benefits uh, to the city. But, but be, uh, uses like that that are off airport, even though they're related to the airport, the city has considerable control over that. So is that something that, is that a function of staff coming up with that? Or is that the city council voting on it? Is that the people being able to import? How do you, how do you get that done? I mean, <laughs> I think it's all, it's all of those things. Right. And, and don't forget that, that in many cases we're talking about private property owners who right. you'll get some pushback, of course, if, they're, if you're limiting their expected uses on the property. I'm not going to go to the takings question, but right. just um, the Well, I mean, the county owns a lot of property in that area. I mean, obviously that map right. showed that. So, so um, there's county property and then there's also private property. And um, yes, I mean, both it, with regard to the county property, what's tricky there is that the county will claim that it has essentially sovereign immunity and that it's not subject to local land use regulations, which is similar to what it's been saying with regard to the conditional use permit. Okay. Um, with regard to other privately owned property, it's a question of does the city council want to direct the staff to come up with recommendations about potential zone changes, which may or may not be acceptable to the people who own that property. So to me, the second step uh, model is it not really the second step. It might be a little higher than yeah, that. Yeah, it's... I you mean, know what I mean? Because like when you showed it on the thing, it was the second step. It seems I guess I would taller. answer and say the devil is in the details. Yeah, always, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. Hello again. More hard questions. <laughs> Hello again. I think the deadline for hard questions passed. <laughs> I think these should be easy. Uh, I, too, live relatively close to the airport for 26 years. I did sign an... Um, uh, a notice that I would live near the airport, but at that point it was called the General Aviation Airport. Somewhere along the line with no notification, no input, no ability to say, hey, no, they changed it to a commercial airport. When we bought our home there, it was a little tiny tower. We used to take our kids to lunch at the little restaurant on top of the tower and there were little tiny planes. Uh, now, um, on the noise issue, uh, my noise issue tends to be from about 9 or 10 p.m. till about 6 or 7 a.m. They were very loud, and I assume it's corporate, rude corporate jets. Um, sometimes they're so loud that my windows shake. Um, uh, there is a regular, uh, not very nice corporate citizen that decides to go to China every Monday morning between 3.30 and about 4.20. And I'm assuming they do that because they can't 
go down to Qual um, they can't go down to uh, San Diego and fly to China because they have uh, noise restrictions until 6 a.m. So uh, the voluntary uh, noise abatement doesn't seem to hold any water toward wealthy corporate jets. Um, to the gentleman who's starting the airline, would love to have you back. Uh, my husband travels a couple hundred um, days a year. He's an American Airlines uh, concierge key person. He's a very one, one of their top 1% flyers. Uh, not a problem to go to San Diego, not a problem to go to LA. Uh, didn't fly the commercial flights here because they would cancel the flights saying there was fog and you'd go out and I'd say, I can see Orion's belt in the Big Dipper. <laughs> so it's, um, it's typically the private planes that are the issue. Um, property values uh, is a concern because the FAA has said, doing concentric circles, that property values around an airport as they expand go down 25 plus percent on a million dollar home, that's $250,000. So to the gentleman that doesn't like to take the $200 taxi, Uber's about $45 and that's a lot of taxis until you hit $250,000. So I have two questions. Carlsbad's plan for the airport traffic with the airport expansion. The um, county said three million people would be coming to and from. They left I-5 out of their PEIR. Um, not sure why. Uh, I guess it belongs to the state, but you know, I-5 traffic is I-5 traffic, so that seemed to be ignored. And then they made some line about paying Carlsbad some money, and they never said about how much money. So what are Carlsbad's plans for handling these three million people that are gonna be coming to the airport, spe spe specifically along Palomar Airport Road, El Camino Real, and then, since those will be road um, gridlocked, Cannon and Poinsettia, and do we have a specific plan and have that has that detailed analysis um, uh, been done? Um, so. Yes, thank you. Okay, we did, we did address some concerns around those issues in our draft comment letter to the county, but I am going to invite our transportation director, Marshall Plants, up to uh, address your question. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for the question. Um, so yes, in their uh, environmental impact report and the analysis they provided, they did have some uh, shortcomings that were commented on in our, in our response letter to them. And so we're waiting for their evaluation of those, of those issues that were raised. Some of those had to do with the way they calculated the future traffic volumes, and others were in their mitigation measures that they proposed. So we called out the fact that our recently adopted mobility element in the general plan um, requires a slightly different approach to mitigating the impacts of the, uh, impa of the, of the additional traffic that would be generated um, should the airport reach the the value or the uh, volumes of, of traffic that they are projecting. So we will um, evaluate their analysis of that once they provide it and um, provide additional feedback as needed. Um, as it relates to I-5 and the scope of their analysis, um, there is a, a sort of a, a way of defining uh, intersections and road segments that are impacted by the, uh, by the proposed improvements. And so they have, uh, again, followed those guidelines that we've provided to them, and where they haven't, we will and have already commented, commented and encouraged them to do so. Um, so I'm not sure if that was... Sufficient. Well, so let me ask you directly. If they're just going to throw some money at Carlsbad, what can Carlsbad do to handle three million more people on Palomar Airport Road and El Camino Real? So I'm not sure I... So the numbers are, are probably not what you're stating, but there will That's be... That's what they said. That's... That came out of their document. So there will be some additional traffic generated. I'm not. The county is. So let me let that's me. A, that's right from the county. That's from the county. Um, that's from the county master plan. I can't cite the page, but that number came from the county document. I, I'm not a traffic person. I'm just a mom. No, I'm just saying. No, I'm telling you how many flights <laughs> I can. Uh, I, I can only put on fifty-five thousand employments in a year. So where's three million people coming? That's a good airport? comment for the master plan. Yeah. Would you, anyway, mind, would you so, mind asking the question again? The, so the question is, if the county's predictions come true, and we have three million more people that will be supported and coming, coming and going out of Palomar Airport along their plan, and they are saying, we're not doing anything, here's some money, Carlsbad, what is my city going to do 
can, can you handle three million more people on Palomar Airport Road and El Camino Real? And if not, how are we going to fix that? What, what's the city going to do? So the traffic analysis that they've prepared and that we will be reviewing or have reviewed to date, um, honestly, just doesn't generate that, that volume of traffic that you're quoting. Okay. But setting that aside, um, the mitigation measures that they are obligated to provide or that we're asking them to provide is to participate in improving the road segments and improving the intersections that are impacted by their traffic. And so they've identified the intersections within the range of the uh, impacts of the increased traffic and evaluated each of those. And when they reach a point that um, the level of service changes to an unacceptable level as defined by the city of Carlsbad, um, then we are asking them to mitigate that by um, providing uh, improvements. And in, in one instance, um, the intersection at um, Camino Vita Roble, mm -hmm. um, the ask is that they participate in improving the actual geometrics of that intersection. And that's where there's some values assigned to that. I think it was a percentage of the cost of what the ultimate cost to improve the intersection are. And then one of the other intersections they identified that might be impacted or would be impacted is at Palomar Airport Road and El Camino Real. And per our mobility element, that intersection is considered to be um, uh, an intersection that we are not going to con uh, continue to widen or to build our way out. And so the obligation there is for them to provide some sort of transportation demand or transportation system management um, strategies and implementation of transportation demand. So that might be transit services or um, like trolleys or, or trams or other sorts of things that get people out of their single occupancy vehicles. So those are the types of, of uh, approaches that we would ask the county to provide um, in their approval of this master plan. And then to the lawyers if they don't? Well, I mean, they're, re they're required under CEQA to mitigate significant impacts, and there are thresholds of significance that they have identified and will identify, particularly if they recirculate any traffic sections. But if they don't um, properly, A, if they've determined that there's a, no significant effect and there actually is a significant effect, that's something that's legally challengeable. Um, but if they have determined that there is a significant effect, they have to have an appropriate mitigation measure okay. that has to Thank be you. adopted as part of the mitigation monitoring program. Thank you. Thank you. I just might note that we are almost running out of time, and I'd encourage folks not, not again, to minimize any of the very, very valuable comments we've gotten this evening. But let's try to focus, if we can, on sort of looking forward and, and, and particularly what, what things we should all be recommending to city council that the uh, well you're lucky because a lot of the things that i was going to talk about or ask about have been covered so this is a a, a great <laughs> it's been a great forum it's been amazing to see all these citizens coming out who care and it's uh, great that the city's given us a, this time my name is shirley anderson i do live in bressy ranch i do live about two and a half miles from the east end of the airport i live right at near that intersection of palomar and el camino real and I wasn't going to talk about it, but just to add to, add to what Vicki had said, uh, that intersection is listed as F in the city. It has failed. Uh, we have a brand new building going up. And it's anybody here from Viasat, shout out to my neighbor, because they're my neighbor now. And that is a million square foot building that's going to house over 3,000 employees. We don't even have the impact of what that's going to do to the community. Plus, the Planning Commission last year approved a residential unit. Um, it's a combination commercial residential, 125 residential units being built at the corner of El Fuerte and Palomar Airport Road, which are is about 2,500 feet from touchdown. So they, they approved it. That's been the disconnect, I think, with the city as they've continued to allow residential development to come in so close to this airport. But I am concerned about the studies that are being done, if they are being done right now. Specifically, what is it in for the city of Carlsbad? Uh, what, uh, is there a cost-benefit analysis study that's being done? What are we going to gain from it? I've seen stuff from the county, but I really haven't seen anything from the city. Um, and then what, what are the, 
revenues currently and what are the revenues from the airport going to be going into the future? So, and I know there's something about taxes with de deplanements of passengers, but that only is for commercial. It is not for any type of passengers traveling on private aircraft. I'm sorry, specifically your question <clears throat> seems to Are we doing cost-benefit analysis studies? The economic analysis. The city hasn't done a cost-benefit analysis related to the airport that I'm aware of. Um, uh, and yeah, I, 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 that just doesn't factor into our analysis of that related to um, commenting on the master plan or the EIR at this point. Because we are going to suffer the greatest impact. It's wondering what the benefit's going to be for us. I think we'll take your comment and include that uh, when we go back to the city council. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. My name is Chris Wright. I live in Carlsbad for, I don't know, 40 years, something like that, native San Diegan. Um, I, um, first of all, I just had to speak out like uh, Ms. Nelson did. Um, we don't have to expand the airport um, just to have passenger commercial flights, and I just want to reemphasize that. Um, and you wanted some answers, and I had some questions with some answers you're requesting of me. Um, you are, you, what I'm af actually interested in is possibly establishing a joint powers agreement that was never uh, signed in the past. Um, and I wondered, would we be considered just a small fry even if we established a, uh, a joint powers agreement? Would we even have a say so with that? Or is it beneficial just to open up the doors to have communication with the county and with the FAA? I think communication is certainly very important. Um, as far as it being aggressive or passive, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna invent a new criteria. Let's be smart. And I think that sometimes people that, that um, you know, try for the impossible, it's not monetarily smart, but it's also sometimes uh, depending on the issues, and I certainly don't understand them as well as you all, but I think that's important um, to just consider what we can accomplish and, and, and be realistic about it. Um, I, I also have to talk, um, one of the things well, I have a list here. The other thing I wanted to say is I would like to establish a noise monitor to measure 500 below the below 500 feet. It was it was in North Carlsbad, and it is no longer right now there. And we need to be able to hear um, and have a, an effective monitor um, in our city so that that those planes that are really I could I could have seen the eye color of the pilot that flew over my house yesterday. Um, <clears throat> Um, the thing I wanted to mention was I, something I brought up at City Council was safety, and we all know, and we talked a little bit about safety this time um, tonight, and one of the things that um, I, I wondered if you had considered, and it, it would be involved in a, in a um, geological report, because I know our city employee here said uh, something about the LEA, but what we need to understand is when these heavier airplanes are coming in or possibly coming in with a possibly expanded airport, um, we need to, those, those heavier jets or airplanes are going to be hitting that, that ground pretty hard. And the geologic reports are going to be critical because of the landfill. We all know Highway 52 is, uh, is bumpy and it's always resettling. And we're going to have higher impacts onto that airport. It's going to make it unsafe where we have airport right now that doesn't have that same kind of weight that's coming into our city as it does, um, you know, as it potentially will affect us in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Nathan Steiger. Short. Um, I'm one of the few that I work on the airport. I'm a native of San Diego, grew up here my whole life. Uh, I can't speak to any of the other comments to the other people, but I do appreciate the form that you guys are providing, and I'm just here to talk about the people that are employed at the airport and what that offers, the employment of uh, Carlsbad and what we do there. 
the biggest part of what we do, and I've, it's, it's always uh, amazing to hear all the comments, and uh, obviously everybody that works here is sensitive to it. I can attest to that. Uh, we are all residents. We're all fathers, mothers, and uh, environmentalists. Surfed here my whole life. Obviously, water and pollution is a huge topic for me. I've been on the airport for earning a paycheck for about 17 years. I was a flight instructor, a corporate pilot, short son as an airline pilot, and now I am the director of F FPO operations for Mc or, um, Magellan Aviation. So uh, the biggest thing is that I want to talk about is the good part. Uh, there is bad, and we're sensitive to it. I know they're noisy. They uh, can produce uh, pollution, just like cars, just like people do. So uh, I'm not going to sit up here and try to defend that, but I am uh, appreciative of the form. But I do want to talk to all the amounts of charity work that these so-called one percenters that people talk down about provide to the nation. Uh, via Carlsbad, uh, Katrina, we loaded up waters, food, rescue teams at, out of CRQ with in benefit with the help of the county. We've all, you know, it's a, it's a hurdle working with any, you know, there's hurdles, and I'm not going to say you're pro-county. I am pro-county because I work at the airport, and that provided me uh, my livelihood, my family's livelihood. My kids go to Carlsbad School Districts. I own a house in Carlsbad. I own a house in Vista. I understand all that, but I do want to talk about what Carlsbad Airport means to not just Carlsbad in California, but what it means to the nation. Because in South America, during the Great Earthquake, we provided water rescue teams, the same type of thing. We, we, we provide dog rescue missions. These rich people, I, you know, it's hard to sit here and you know, back them all the way, first world problems, right? But we do provide a service for all of the United States at a CRQ. This is a thriving city. This, this airport is busier. And I, as I understand it, the 20-year master plan, and I don't know if the numbers are skewed or however it is, but as I understand it, that might be a realistic number in 20 years. But if you're not planning for the future, what are you doing? If you're not growing, you're shrinking. So it's coming. It's here. I've been on the airport for almost 17 years. It is busier. It's going to get busier. And what I'm hoping you listen is that instead of attacking companies that you may or not know everything about attacking jobs and environmental impact studies. That's all well and good, but you know the airline that was not of Hook. It was a uh, Caljet, and so a lot of people are referring to poor Hook here. Um, that Elite <laughs> Airways. It wasn't his fault, but um, they are trying to supply commercial service. And uh, Carlsbad was a big provider for the uh, attacks on uh, Las Vegas. And a lot of people traveled out of that airline to get to see their family members and wounded ones. Uh, country music stars were flying in out of here. And that was out of CRQ, Viasat. All these companies come together when bad things happen on our soil to provide help, rescue. Um, we're talking thousands of people's jobs. And I understand. I don't want to talk about they fly over my house. I'm jaded. I love, it. I, love, I love airplanes. I love working with airplanes. But at some point, I used to surf Tamarack Beach and Terramar, and it was my dad, myself, and two other friends. Now there's two, 300 people. I got to prepare for that. So as you look under the scale of what we can do and how we can do it, we really need to understand that the airport is coming. Longer runway? Who doesn't want a longer runway to be safer? It is a safe airport. But who doesn't want, you know, as a pilot, I know, I know it's funny, right? But it, it's true. It, it is what is happening. So either we deal with it together as in resolving noise abatements, coming up with strategizing how the routes fly, sensors, and we police ourselves through the county or however we do it and have them be more transparent. It will come together. But I'm here to tell you this airport is going to get busy. You know, it, it is busy. It's busy now. But... <coughs> Here we are, and I think if we work together as citizens, uh, businessmen, entrepreneurs, commerce, it's here and it's thriving. So, thank you for your time. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Richard. The reason I uh, moved here in Carlsbad in 87, there's, uh, I, I moved here in 1987 to Carlsbad, and uh, I've seen a lot of changes. I see the graph that you guys had the green, and uh, you know everything else on the pie graph seemed to be somebody else, all right, namely the San Diego County. San Diego County, as you said earlier about snarky, why don't they want to sell the airport? Why don't they sell the airport to Carlsbad? Is it, is it for sale? Can they put it up for sale? And does the city of Carlsbad want to pay for it? Do they want to buy it? And then so, then you, the three people up here that have the law degrees, can maybe make it happen and do what all these other people want to do. All right, so uh, that's, that's part of that, if they want to sell the airport. Number two is, is that uh, about congestion, and they were talking about congestion and put this poor man on the, on the, on the seat. When I came here in 87, there was no Aviera. The gentleman said he, he bought an Aviera. They didn't want to mess up the mountains. They didn't want to bring in the hotels. They didn't want, the cost it was just a movie stars and the mafia that came here when I moved here, and that was it, all right? Nobody even knew, and now it's the Golden Door in Escondido, but that's what La Costa used to be like when I first moved here. They put in, Melrose went through. Uh, all the roads that went through, um, El Fuerte, you name it. Leo Carrillo was a ranch, and the lady said about coyotes. That's when I came here, was coyotes. La Costa Avenue was just one way. So all of these thoroughfares, Aviera didn't go through. All of these uh, roads. So what I want to compliment the city of Carlsbad is they have an extremely great vision. When I came here in 87, the vision was to do what they did. They've grown this city to be unbelievably beautiful. We love it here. We love Aviera, we love La Costa, we love all the places that are in Carlsbad. Carlsbad Village has expanded. The little roads down, down Carlsbad, the Coast Highway, etc., etc. So there's no legal, it seems like you guys are limited legally. You talked about one here at the bottom about, uh, what was it called, government cha or governance, governance changes. The city of Carlsbad and the county, if you can't buy the airport, work with the county. All right, that's the only thing that sounds to me that you guys can't do. You can't change the law. People are complaining about the small airplanes, not the commercial. They, they talked about the helicopters that have been here since the beginning of time. They talked about the small prop jets. We talked about the United Airlines. United Airlines was a prop. I was also around here at that time, and the prop jets were noisy. The, the, the other jets are quite, quite quiet, very quiet, as a matter of fact. Number two, it's going to limit sometimes the, the, the prop jets carry 25 people, all right? These jets can carry, uh, Mr. Hook's planes can carry 40 to 50 people. Less flights, more people, bigger capacity. The vision of Carlsbad wants to make money. They want, and speaking of making money, what does the county make by having this? Why don't they want to sell the airport? That's my question. I mean, is it, is it a money maker for them? Is it a money maker for the city of Carlsbad? Because it sure doesn't seem like you guys have any control over that. So only the county has control over that airport. So where's the money? Like what's that old mafia guy say? Follow the money and you'll find out where it, what's happening. So if we follow that money, these people might get what they want, no noise. There's, I mean, you guys already brought up thousands of ways to eliminate noise, to change the flight path, you talk with the county. We want to do a. We want to work together with this government changes. City of Carlsbad works with the with the county of San Diego, and that sounds like the only way that's going to help this out. Because legally speaking, it sounds like you guys are hands are tied, and the airport is not going to go away, as Nate said earlier in his conversation. The airport is here; it will always be here. The only thing we can do is work together as a community see the vision that Carlsbad has, and then tell the county to get on board because the city of Carlsbad is even better than the city of San Diego, in my opinion, as far as growth and the way to keep it together. That's all I got to say. Thank you. R really quickly, I just want to mention, we did receive two uh, additional written comments. I think they're redundant. Uh, one related to flight paths and how we can impact those, and another with several comments, but not a specific question. So uh, we'll include those in our... Um, notes going forward. Frank, and then uh, is there thank one you, more Jason. After so that, uh, we'll I'm going to keep this short. Uh, four comments and one question slash request. I know the hour is late, so thank you for letting me speak. My name is Frank Sung. I've lived in Carlsbad for 16 years. I live near uh, Poinsettia Park and Pacific Rim Elementary School. It seems to me, as I listen to all of this, that 
uh, it seems like we have a safe airport and we ought to be pushing for a no build option. That's uh, comment number one. Comment number two, it seems to me that we should be promoting uh, commercial commuter service. We had it, let's try to promote it and, and get it back so we have the conveniences. This airport is a resource and we ought to take advantage of it as is. Number three comment is that we ought to be developing a resident friendly flight tracks that's enforceable, quote unquote, and you know perhaps we can educate the uh, pilots to adhere to it. That's the third comment. The fourth comment is that while uh, pushing for a no-build option, it seems that that would be the best way to honor our commitment to protect our environment, whether that's groundwater, uh, greenhouse gas, uh, air traffic, and noise pollution. So those are my four comments and my question slash request as you leave from here uh, is how can you craft, you guys have the experience, you've seen what works, you've done the risk benefit analysis, how can you craft a plan to reach a win-win between business and residential needs Get the county the buy-in for a no-build option. Thank you. Hi, Mary Ann Viney. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, ask some questions tonight and to hear all of what you had to say. It was really informative. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, the first one is in terms of the water quality data that we had talked about earlier um, concerning the, the city of Carlsbad's monitoring of uh, the groundwater and other um, receiving water, such as the uh, Encinas Creek, the Aquahiti on the lagoon, and also those uh, storm drain outfalls that um, uh, are, uh, that, that accept uh, whatever uh, waters from the airport. So I'm wondering if, um, I could see some of that data, if some of that data could be shared with me in order to just have a look at it. And the second question is um, in terms of CO2 and other GHG um, emissions, how will that change if the airport is, if the airport changes do go through? And also, how will Carlsbad's um, climate action plan change? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to suggest that you follow up with Jamie Wood after the meeting to talk about what data is available related to uh, groundwater uh, impacts. Uh, and uh, Dave DeCordova, would you mind coming up and talking a little bit about um, emissions and CAP um, related comments that uh, we've provided on the EIR? Sure. Uh, with respect to the, uh, thank you for the, for the questions. Um, with respect to the GHG emissions as a result of the um, implementation of the county's proposed plan, we did make, uh, thank you, extensive comments uh, on their analysis. Um, in fact, we, we had um, suggested that they, they needed to go back and redo their, their GHG analysis. Um, and we understand that that is, in fact, what the county is going to be doing uh, on Thursday when they release their, uh, their recirculated portion. So one of them is going to be a a um, additional analysis on the GHG. With respect to the city's climate action plan, <clears throat> what our, our CAP focuses on are those activities and measures that the city can uh, have an effect on, right? So the county airport, because it is owned and operated by the county, our CAP does not cover those activities. So it's up to the county to develop their own uh, GHG reduction measures as it relates to the operation of the county. Um, and that was also what we had commented on. Um, I believe when the uh, EIR was initially released, the county hadn't quite adopted their cap yet, but they have since then. So um, I would hope and expect that the, that the revised analysis on their um, GHG section will include and incorporate um, their plans relative to their climate action plan. Let's add one more thing on that. Sarah, um, go ahead, please. And, and I, would, I would also add on that, um, excuse me, I just wanted to, I would also add that when the county does come out with its new GHG um, analysis, 
that they're likely to include a technical report, which if you really want to get into the weeds of the data, will be in the, be sure to go back and look at the technical report as opposed to the summary that's going to be in their new draft document. Okay, Ken, bring it home as our final public speaker. I appreciate that. My name is Ken Hume. I live in Cayenne Lane over in La Costa. I overlook the north line of uh, the La Costa Golf Course. And uh, this is a very divisive issue. It's going to have the potential of driving deep divides within the community. And I would encourage city staff to come up with a thoughtful communications plan and uh, a public outreach plan to be able to get more information. There's a very small sample that you, he that you see here tonight. So if you can increase that amount of, of input from the community, from more people, and be able to be able to provide facts as far as you know, the issues at the airport and how it's going to be moving forward, the schedule, I think would be uh, very helpful. Thank you um, for a great discussion. Lots of really good viewpoints tonight. I'm going to hand it off to Celia Brewer to wrap it up for us tonight. I'll say a couple of things. First of all, thank you all for your civilized participation. Um, we're going to take all of your input, and we're going to take the wisdom of our outside council, and we will be going back to the city council um, in open session with a strategy um, for their consideration. I also want to point out that the tape of tonight's meeting, there will be a videotape, but it won't be available for a couple of days, but then there will be a link available. And I hope that you all leave with a feeling that there are pathways forward that are positive, that are collaborative, and that can improve our relationship with respect to the airport um, and try to accommodate a lot of these needs, but it's going to take a little bit of time and a lot of conversation and um, forging some relationships. So with that, I'd like to conclude and say, give yourselves a hand. You sat through a long technical meeting. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>